Video games! That's what's happening. This business called video. No, this this business we call video. Welcome to the Jeff Gerstman Show. I'm hosting this week's installment of the show. My name is Jeff Gerstman, and it is. I was going to say October. It's it, uh, it is mid. It's, let's call it mid September in 2023, the 19th, if we want to be exact about it. We're here. It's been a. It is. Uh, it has been a wild week, and oh, I guess suppose a wild morning. Uh, as well with a bunch of various leaks and uh, well, yeah, I don't know. There's, there's been a, a, a lot of crazy things happening over, over the course of the week. Um, maybe we should just get into the news a little bit, huh? Maybe we just get into some of the news. I got a, I, we just, we just get into it. You seen the, <laughs> seen these fucking unity guys <laughs> in the news um unity has been in the news for the past week or so uh and um boy oh boy they have found a way to i i'm not going to say completely destroy their business but uh, I saw someone say yesterday that they had managed to unify game developers against them in a way never seen before. Um, Unity rolled out a new pricing structure, a new fee. Unity, if you don't know, is a, is a game engine, much like the Unreal Engine or I don't know, Renderware, <laughs> uh, the uh, id tech, uh, the source engine, name an engine. Um, unity is one of them and, and unity is, um, has been around for a long time. It, uh, it had a really rough reputation some years ago on the user end because we got to a point where users, players were, were associating the, uh, the unity engine with bad performance on console and developers would be like, no, that's not true. Unity, you know. That's oh boy oh boy that that's not the thing. It's Unity is fine. Some some developers don't use it well. Blah blah blah. Developers were defending the Unity engine then. Um, I don't think we'll see many game developers defending Unity. This at, the, at this point they've got a new plan. Well they okay so they rolled out a new feature. So Unity if you want to use the Unity engine to make your game. You tend to subscribe to a tiered package. You know, if you want the pro or enterprise, you know, if you're a big developer, you're going to pay them thousands of dollars a month for access to the full on unity. If you're a, a hobbyist developer, a small time indie developer, you're going to go for one of these lower tiers. They shuffled some of the tiers around, eliminated what they call, I believe they called unity plus, but more importantly, changed their fee structure in such a way where they said, okay, from, from here on out, past a certain date, and there'll be some grandfathering here and there, little, you know, little things here and there. But past a certain date, we are going to charge you 20 cents every time your video game is installed. Um, which is bonkers. Uh, it, it's, it's really wild. Uh, just a, a, a and, and, and brings with it a ton of questions that they then didn't answer. And uh, in fact, actually, I believe when Steven Totillo at Axios started to ask them questions about it in terms of like, well, what happens if someone reinstalls the game, like deletes it and, and, and reinstalls it? Are, is that going to be another 20 cents? And they were like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that'll be another 20. Yeah, yeah, that's going to be another 20 cents. Uh, and they called it a runtime fee that's like, oh, the Unity runtime, if it's in your thing, you know, you got to get um, um and and there was not a lot of nuance to it. And so I think a lot of uh, people who use Unity and people who don't use Unity, there was a, a very, the, the reaction to it was like, fucking what? Uh, I'm sorry. Well, like, you're what? Uh, and started asking the questions like, well, what happens to if, uh, if it's a demo for your game? What happens if it's an art project? What happens if it's in a charity bundle? What happens if it's on Game Pass? What happens... And they had answers like, oh, well, if it's on Game Pass, Microsoft is going to pay that, which had a real like, we're going to build this wall and 
fuck Mexico's gonna I, they're they'll take they'll, they're gonna pay us for it. like just did this real like fuck, oh really have you checked with them on that um just a real bizarre uh, uh, turn for them to take for a, for a for an engine that had uh, seen better days, I guess, in terms of um, how they had been perceived by developers. You know, it's been it's been kind of rough for them for a little bit. Um, but man, oh man! Um, so. After people started poking holes in this and being like, how are you going to detect that people are installing it and not, um, you know, like people started coming up with scenarios like, well, what if someone decides they want to uninstall and reinstall my game a million times, like just spins up some VMs because they want to fuck me over. Um, and they were like, uh, we'll, we'll work with develop. If you suspect that the count is wrong, we, uh, we have ways to, we have ways. We, have, we, we, uh, it's just, uh, yeah, it's like the, the. Like we we know what we're doing, which they have not earned that in the past with some of the stuff they did around ad tech and and everything. So for them to come back around and be like, oh yeah, we can we can do we can do this count really well. Like, mm -mm, mm -mm. um, and so uh, that led to developers freaking out and being like, you know, you you have some developers who are years in on a project, like, oh, I've been working on this Unity game for the last three years, and now suddenly. You are pulling the rug out from under me uh, and making it so my game, if it manages to make any money, will now actually make no money. And like, like what, what the fuck? Like, it's a really crazy turn of event. Like, you just look at it and go like, I, I don't, like, clearly in no universe was any kind of change like this going to go over positively, but I, I don't understand what the goal is here that, like, they thought that they could just... Like, did they think that Unity was so popular and, and irreplaceable that they were just like, well, fuck it. I mean, clearly they were looking at the the higher and, and they were trying to set limits. It's like, well, you have to hit this much revenue overall before we start taking any money and blah, blah. Um, in a way that made it look like they were going after, you know, mobile gotcha games. Like the, the real target is like, can we make a bunch? We should be making more money off of Genshin Impact, I think is the short version of. Uh, what their strategy probably is here, but the number of developers that get kind of caught up in the middle of it um, with a sudden turn of events of just like, oh, this is not what I signed up for, and you are now changing the deal in a way that is um, bizarre uh, and and not friendly to developers, not, not a developer relations-focused uh, set of announcements um, is really something else. So... It sounds like they, you know, they then, you know, the, as you expect, uh, I believe it was first thing yesterday morning, they posted the, we hear you and we're listening and we're going to uh, write a tweet about this that says, we hear you and we're, uh, we have a, we're working on, you know, blah, blah, we, we've got a thing in, 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 uh, and, and and it sounds like that they're working on their backpedal. They haven't announced it yet. Bloomberg, I guess, has the details of, um, the plan they've been floating internally, which I don't know if this leaked because someone was angry or maybe this leaked because they're trying to test the waters and be like, is this going to, if we turn the knob down this way, is this, are you going to stop? Yes, please. Um, and so this tentative new plan, according to Bloomberg, is that they will limit the fees to 4% of a game's revenue for customers making over $1 million. And then installations counted towards reaching the threshold won't be retroactive. Um, and that's a recording of a meeting that I guess someone sent to Bloomberg. Um, and then um, uh, Unity had to close a couple of offices because they said they received a credible death threat. And then the word going around after the fact is that that death threat came from an employee of Unity. So there you go. Um, now, and, and I guess part of the other, the other Monday information uh, was that instead of whatever proprietary counting technology that they were working on, that they're now saying like, oh, you can self-report your install count to us. And so the number of things that they've now walked back or, or that they, it sounds like they're thinking about walking back. Cause again, they, this is not a plan they've announced as far as I can tell. This is just something that they, they rolled out internally, uh, in a meeting yesterday. Um, 
And uh, according to Bloomberg here, in the meeting, Riccatello, Rick, John Riccatello uh, is the, the CEO of Unity. You may remember him from running EA, from uh, running the company that owned BioWare and then bringing them into EA. And you may remember him from an era of EA that people don't necessarily look back on fondly. Uh, you may remember him from some dumb shit Unity did six months ago. Um, anyway, <laughs> John Brickatella emphasized that the new policy is designed to generate more revenue from the company's biggest customers and that more than 90% of Unity users won't be affected. Um, and as a quick quote in here from uh, the, the, the Bloomberg story ends with a little quote here. It says, I don't think there's any version of this that would have gone down a whole lot differently than what happened. It is a massively transformational change to our business model, but I think we could have done a lot, a lot of things a lot better. Um, so I, I, yeah, I, you know, the, the whole idea of this is, this is going to not touch 90% of unity users. A lot of unity users started doing the math on their games and going, wait, no, this actually does. This would impact me. This, this, you know, which, and 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 so the 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 idea of this not touching most people that are using Unity um, seems like a weird one. Um, but separately from that, like that's that's we can debate that. We can go, you know, if we crack open everyone's books, I'm sure we can get to the bottom of this. But none of that matters. At the end of the day, none none of it matters. Because basically what they've done is they have shown their willingness to change their terms of service. They updated their terms of service like a couple of months before this to remove the idea that like, oh, hey, if you, um, well, you know, if, if you, uh, if you use unity at this point in time and this, these are the terms you've signed up for, then these are the terms you signed up for. They removed the part that, that said that they can't update the terms. And so now here they are updating the terms and um, they have ruined their reputation in the game industry. And who would, who would, who would look at this? Let's say they roll this out. Let's, let's say that none of these, um, none of these changes end up impacting nine more, more than 90% of people who use unity. Uh, let's say commercially, let's even limit it because you know, the 90% of people who use unity that's probably a number that includes everyone who's ever fucking downloaded Unity and fucked around with it and not made anything or made a little crappy art project or did something for a live stream or, did, you know, like that's, it's a big number if we're not talking, if we're not limiting it to people who have shipped commercial products on the Unity engine, which I'm sure is a fraction of a fraction, blah, 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 blah. So the number of, of commercial developers that'll be impacted by this, um, Again, probably, probably up for debate. Um, who would trust Unity ever again? You will have developers that are trapped on a project. They're like, we're too deep in. We can't not use Unity. Uh, Brandon Sheffield of uh, uh, Necrosoft Games. They've got a game coming up here that is a Unity game that they're just like, well, shit. Um, they can't just... You know, it, it would take so much work for a lot of these developers to port their work away from Unity. They may have years of experience in the Unity engine, which now they're probably regretting spending all of those years working in this engine that now they're desperate to get off of. Um, who, if anyone was building another project right now and specking out like, oh, we're going to make this. Who would use Unity? Because you don't know what they're going to do tomorrow. You know? They've, they've been so willing, so flippantly willing to destroy the trust they have. What, what trust they had left after the kind of ad tech stuff and some of the other things they've done over the last year or two. Um, their willingness to just throw that away um, has just further destroyed that trust. Like, who who is going to look at Unity as like a viable thing and not go like, well, shit, man. What if... Um, Revenue is down again, and, and JR needs to, you know, he needs a new boat. He needs a third boat. Can we get Rigatello a third boat? We hook that up. 
we can if we tweak this this part of the deal and this part of the deal and this you know so yeah i i don't it, it's hard to see um i i don't know what work they would have to do to try to like repair this breach and and try to repair this reputation but just from a pure business standpoint from a pure business stability standpoint if you are in the business of making games and you're in the business of using the unity engine to do that. I, I can't imagine a, a scenario where you don't at least like, you know, when you're on your next project, when you're you know, between, between projects, whatever it is, I, that you don't sit down and go like, all right, what are we using? Cause it ain't going to be unity. Are we using Godot? Can, can Godot uh, appear on consoles? Is there, are there really good ways for that engine to export to Xbox and switch and all that other stuff? Do we need to go to Unreal Engine? Um, like, what are what are the options for us here? Um, it's crazy. It's 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 really um, it's shocking. You know, you're just like, oh man, because Unity has you know Unity has been there for a lot of years, and um, again, I, it did have a reputation. I think you know people you would see people and, and you would see like th this was like, this went around in the angry YouTuber um, community at one point. I want to say it was like, like around the release of Firewatch before Firewatch came out actually. But around then um, where you just had these people going like the unity engine, make games run like shit on it. And then they were, they were like the unity engines fucking trash and, and, and all this other stuff. Um, and, and, you know, you, you would have a lot of developers go like, well, great. Now the unity logo is on the front of my game. And then now, now people think automatically that it's going to run bad. That's going to do this when that's not the case. I mean, unity did have a kind of a rough road for a while. There are people, Hey, and there are people from y years of unity use that have like extreme horror stories of using the unity engine to try to get a game onto consoles. Um, because whatever version they were using and trying to get a game on, you know, that is just Sometimes that's a disaster, but that's, you know, that's life in technology. I don't know that that doesn't seem like something that's like quite on the scale and the level of what we're talking about today. Um, so, yeah, I, I, it's in, in, I don't really see a way back for unity at this point, other than years of work, other than hiring a bunch of uh, developer relations people to go like, Hey buddy, why don't we take you out to dinner? We'll talk to you about this. We'll figure out. <laughs> Um, to try to like smooth this over, but like who in their right mind would use unity again? And so this led to like, you know, you, you have a lot of developers out there that were just like, okay, well we use unity's technology and ad stack for serving ads in our games. And we're boycotting iron source, which is, and then the, the unity ad tech services, we're turning it all off until you fix this until you walk these back. And so you have a, a number of developers that have signed that petition and say that they're going to disable uh, ad revenue, which Unity gets a cut of um, in, in, or until this changes. Yeah, and that's a... You know, when you're making the people mad who are putting like ads like mobile developers and whatever else, like, what you know, what, what's, what the fuck's going on? Jesus Christ. Um, so... Uh, you've got that happening and, and, you know, in, in the, the aftermath of the initial announcement, you had like the inner sloth, like the, you know, the developers of, Amo of among us basically saying like, this is fucking terrible. And they're like a big company. Like, you know, they, Hey, they make a lot of money. Like they would, they, you know, they, they would survive this, right. It wouldn't be devastating. They could make it until they make another game and make another engine, blah, blah, blah. They could, they could probably afford the 20 cents or something, but Instead, they were just like, well, yeah, if this stays like this, we're going to have to, in instead of making new content for Among Us, we are going to have to uh, spend a bunch of time porting our game to another engine because fuck you. Well, they, did, they did not actually. Well, maybe they did actually. Some developers in, in making their fucking hilarious like Twitter apology graphic looking post definitely ended it with, and by the way, fuck you. <laughs> um and so, yeah, uh, so this stuff, that stuff is ongoing and still on fire Ag again, as, as far as I know, the, the updated new plan, the updated new, new plan has not been something that they have tried to roll out publicly, but again, that that's, that's kind of beside the point. It's, it's sort of separate from the actual issue, which of course is, 
uh, if you're going to spend years, if you're going to to stake your entire company uh, on these sorts of tech choices, and uh, you know, hey, we we've, we've got to figure out, you know, hey, we're we're going to spend the next four years working on this game. We got what engines should we choose? Uh, it's it's a very I, I it's it's very hard to imagine developers going Unity. That's the choice. Uh, it it just seems like that's uh, over and done with. And I don't know how they get that back, other than like, hey, in five years' time, maybe people will have forgotten how fucking terrible this was, and they'll be like, oh, Unity. That's a yeah yeah Unity's still around. Yeah, I guess we can check it out. Um. But I don't, I don't know, you know, even if they walked all the way back, even if they said like, we're sorry, we're not changing anything. The very idea that they could and the very idea that they could change it again and that they're there. And that now they're looking, we're like, oh, well, what can we do? What can we get away with? Where is the line? If this p- pisses people off, well, maybe we could do this. Maybe we do. And so if they're going to be on the hunt for money like that, um, uh, they're that's they're they're in trouble. Um, and presumably they, you know, I, 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 I don't know that unity has been doing amazing and, and all that other stuff. Cause they fucked up. They went out and bought wet. They, they made a bunch of like weird acquisitions and, and bought all this ad tech and, and, and everything too. So it's just real. Yeah. I don't know. Unity has not looked, uh, like a, a great business for a while now. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. If you're a game developer, I, I have to imagine if, if you are, if you use Unity, you are probably, well, you're looking over the Unreal Engine docs. You're looking over their terms. You're looking over, you're looking to see what you can do that's not Unity because uh, Unity seems like it's over. I, we'll, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. You know, and, and, and they do things that are not game related. There's other... Uh, you know, like what are they like defense contracting or something, right? I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that, a lot of hot businesses over there. Uh, so, um, awesome, great work to everyone over there. I, I gotta imagine that there's, you know, you you would imagine that there are people on the ground at Unity, people probably in developer relations that are just like good people that care about games that want to do right by everyone. And then these terms get smashed past them. And they're just like, (laughs) I've spent years trying to build up a reputation here at like, you know, trying to make this seem like a good company to work with. And you have just, you've go, you've walked in with a can of gas cackling and lit it all on fire. (laughs) Um, as fucking sucks, man. I'm, yeah, like I said, I'm sure there's I'm sure there's some good people working at Unity that uh well eh, maybe they're cleaning up their old uh resume. Who knows? Who knows? What a fucking mess. Um and and uh, in, in other news Basically everything Microsoft has thought about or uh, written down <laughs> when it comes to acquisitions and new consoles leaked out overnight. Um, these are documents that I guess found their way into evidence during the uh, trial with the Federal Trade Commission. Um, and a lot of P- like PDFs, you know, done up in the Microsoft style, like like got out there along with the uh, contents of some emails. Uh, probably, I guess the 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 juiciest tidbits uh, is the idea of an updated Xbox Series X and S uh, being in the works. This is not like a an upgraded console in the way that the Xbox One X was so it's not you know there's been a lot of uh, you know Phil Spencer has been out there talking for a while about not doing a mid generation refresh and that's um that seems true they are they are not making it they are not upgrading it um there's people in the chat right now that have seen the document that is there's a reference in there to the to there's a the Xbox Series X going all digital. And there's a phrase on the slide that says the most powerful Xbox ever now adorably all digital and saying, what kind of marketing is that? And someone in chat says, it's not marketing. These are internal documents not meant to be seen outside. They would never, 
they would not use language like that outside. And that's them talking about the mock-ups and, and all that other stuff. So, um, basically what it sounds like the plan is here is something that is codenamed Brooklyn. Um, and the main changes seem to be like updating the wireless radios, um, in order to, you know, like offering a two terabyte option, but basically this is a cheaper, um, cheaper to build, not cheaper to sell a cheaper to build, uh, Xbox series X, um, that goes all digital. So they lose the drive. Um, they go to Wi-Fi six E for their radio. So that's, you know, the six E is, I guess it's lower latency, potential faster throughput. Like I, I have had a Wi-Fi six, I've had a Wi-Fi seven, which is not ratified yet, but it, it is like draft spec Wi-Fi seven router for a little bit. And I don't have any Wi-Fi six devices. I'm going to get one of these new iPhones and that I think will be the first Wi-Fi six E device, um, in my home. Um, just very exciting. Uh, but you know, so, so basically this is updating a lot of the wireless stuff, Bluetooth 5.2 and, um, something they call Xbox wireless two, which I believe is, is new. Uh, the, the actual kind of new part here. So there's, you know, and so these documents, let's see. Um, the console itself is redesigned to be kind of round on the front and it has a USB C port on it. Uh, I think it looks all right for what it is. Um, the internal documents where they're trying to find ways to like, what's, what's our selling piece here? What are we, you know, what are we making happen? The, the boilerplate line here is Brooklyn, which is the code name for the device. <clears throat> Brooklyn will deliver 4k gen nine console gaming with more internal storage, faster Wi-Fi, reduced power, a more immersive controller, and a beautiful redesign that elevates the all digital experience of the Xbox ecosystem. Um, new design, more internal storage, USB-C front port with power delivery, all new, more immersive controller, same great, great price for 99. Now keep in mind, these are all internal docs that are, are not all that recent in that term. So if you're going to get hung up on numbers and go like, they said it was going to be 499 and it's not, or you know, like, like, don't, this is all obviously super subjects to change. Uh, none of this was even meant to be seen by any of us. Uh, all new Southbridge to modernize the IO and sustainability efforts. There's a big push around here about sustainability. Uh, the, the power supply takes 15% less power. A new low power standby mode is 20% of the current Xbox series S standby mode, recyclable packaging, uh, increased use of PCR on the housing. Um, and so, you know, in, in terms of recyclability, sustainability, and, and so on and so forth like that, um, that seems to be the, like, like part of it. And, and those are things that, you know, are, are, that's a nice story to tell. Uh, it's the right thing to do, uh, honestly. Uh, and also, um, you know, redesigning the internals helps them make it, uh, more effectively, you know, but less expensively. Uh, they're going to a six nanometer die shrink for improved efficiency. And so um, it helps modernize their internals, uh, which, which probably makes them helps them make the console for less money, which then in turn makes it so that they can make more profit per console sold. The updated controller seems like the actual new thing here. Um, and, uh, it features a direct to cloud, uh, a direct cloud functionality, which is similar to the Stadia controller, where instead of having a controller that connects to an Xbox or connects to a, a TV, not an Xbox, but let's say the the controller connects to your television, connects to your to your tablet, and then all of that connects to the internet. Uh, the controller itself connects to the internet and talks to the cloud service directly, so it's kind of like one fewer hop, if you will. Uh, that was the pitch for Stadia. I imagine that that is uh, what they're talking about here when they say direct to cloud. Um, that on paper that seemed like a cool idea. I just never liked using the Stadia controller. So if I ever used Stadia, it was with an Xbox controller plugged into a computer. 
uh, running a browser. So, <laughs> so it was, it was never, uh, uh, never really the thing. The it looks like they're shifting to a rechargeable and well, it says rechargeable and swappable battery, and that's they've had that for a long time. Uh, so I don't know if that's necessarily a new thing or if that's something they're like, hey, here are the bullet points we can use when we when we talk more about uh, sustainability. Um, and so I don't know if it'll take regular batteries or not, or if it will only take these rechargeable batteries because the the charge and swap I've got I've got rechargeable batteries in my existing xbox controller right now um you know they've been they've been selling these things for a while uh so i i imagine that that is uh similar to what they're talking about um quieter buttons and thumbsticks i'm into the the clicky nature of the xbox stick has got i've stopped using it uh because i, I play games in a room with a sleeping child sometimes and the clicky D-pad of an Xbox controller is too much. And so it's led to me spending... I, I, I got into controllers all of a sudden. And that has that currently ended with me using a DualSense Edge, which is uh, a nice controller. I don't know if I'd call it a, a, a worth $200, but what the fuck is worth $200 anymore anyway? Uh, it's a nice controller. The textured uh, grips on the, uh, the triggers. It's good. Anyway. Um... Accelerometer in the controller, um, updated haptics, the haptics double as speakers. So you can, you know, theoretically use the, uh, use the haptics to emit sound, which is sort of, so the, the haptics on a PlayStation dual sense, I believe the signal gets sent from the console in the form of a waveform. So you are kind of sending sound to the controller to make it vibrate on a PS5. And so this sounds like it's probably similar to that conceptually uh they just say precision haptic feedback haptics double as speakers accelerometer quieter buttons and thumbsticks lift to wake so you know if you pick up the controller it will it will turn on and wake up i suppose um same layout and activation forces for the buttons and sticks and so on Improved longevity is it's durable and reliable new modular thumbsticks improved longevity continued build improvements so that that sounds cool. I don't know the. I think the current Xbox controller is great. Uh, it's a, again a little on the loud side, but um, I think it's a fantastic controller. These seem like good updates to it. Uh, a little bit of tech in there to kind of further push the cloud gaming stuff, which is probably a good idea. But I, you know, I don't know the. These documents kind of get into some of the cloud stuff in ways that like you start to think like, oh, they care a lot more about this than anyone else does, and and maybe they will make it matter years down the line but right now right now uh not so much um and so they're looking at getting that controller out for 70 dollars, announcing it in q4 of fiscal what okay let me it was a quick translation here fiscal year 2024 q4 like what is that that's uh Financial year is like June 30th. What are they? Let's. Yeah, they go. They go basically July to July is, is the standard kind of thing here when we think about fiscal years. So Q4 fiscal of 2024, would that be around the June time frame next year for the con the controller launch if i'm doing that math correctly and maybe i'm not um um but basically yeah launching the controller yeah okay so june yeah is is what they're talking about may may for launching the controller june for uh, kind of their E3 announced time frame, which is potentially where they would announce the upcoming new consoles, codenamed Elwood and Brooklyn. 60-day plus uh, with, uh, with the Elwood, which Elwood is a... Sorry, um, but we're jumping ahead here. Elwood is a kind of updated Xbox Series S that includes those same guts. Wi-Fi 6E, 
the the updated Xbox wireless standard, Bluetooth 5.2, blah, 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 you know? Uh, so my, the relatively minor upgrades for the Xbox Series S because that's already, well, upgrades is maybe the, not the right term to use here, uh, but it would include the new controller um, and it would, uh, as the Series S is currently, it would not have a disk drive on it. Brooklyn, you know, the, the, the updated Xbox Series X going all digital is interesting and weird because there's nothing on this slate for mid-gen devices that includes a disk drive. And so if this is the push they're going to make, because they do, do talk about, well, maybe they don't go... Let me continue looking here. Um, okay, so in late August, the updated Xbox Series S launches for two ninety nine, and then in late October, again, uh, again, this is this is twenty twenty four. We're talking about here. Um. the two terabyte updated Xbox Series X launches uh, for $499. Uh, some additional bullet points here. Uh, 60 pl day plus separation between launches enables dialogue with different audiences. You know, okay, yeah. Allows us to focus on new improvements in the controller and tell stories beyond the console uh, direct to consumer. Yeah. Adds value to the consoles at announce. Uh... It gives uh, gives the updated Series S its own moment earlier in the holiday time frame to maximize sales. Last chance, Edith. Uh, 512 at 199 as Black Friday offer. So old X, the idea of... I, I, so that's... What is... Shit, man. All right, we're going to type Xbox Edith into the internet and make sure that that... Well, Edith Finch. There you go. Um, I assume Edith is the Series S based on what the the context here but i but i don't know that for sure that the, so basically they they will end of life the existing series s and blow those out for 199 on black friday that year uh to get them out uh and they say something called starkville will go end of life ahead of the brooklyn launch i don't know what starkville is <laughs> uh let's type starkville Uh, Xbox for sale in Stark, Starkville, Mississippi. So the series, uh, I guess the, the existing series X is Starkville. Um, but it's not, yeah. Okay. So that, that's the, the, some of the other reporting on, on these same leaks are also kind of not a hundred percent sure what Starkville is, but but they seem to be saying that, yeah, that's probably the existing Series X. So think about that. Um, if they end of life, the existing Xbox, so let's, let's assume that Starkville is the entire Xbox Series X product line and not like a, did they do multiple SKUs of like, hey, this one's one terabyte, this one's two, or, or this one's 512 and this one's two, or is this just the one? Um that that i don't I, I don't have that off the top of my head but uh if there's just the one if we assume that starkville is the entire existing xbox series x product line if that is going to go end of life ahead of the launch of the codename brooklyn xbox series x which according to these documents does not have a disk drive on it um then there will no longer be an Xbox console on shelves or, you know, being made, I guess I should say, that includes a slot for physical media. Um, that doesn't seem great. Uh, it doesn't seem great for their backwards compatibility story in a world where a game like 50 Cent Blood on the Sand... Um, is no longer being sold digitally. The only way to get it is to get a physical copy of it and jam it into an Xbox. Um, then, then that's, uh, yeah, I don't know. That's, it's an interesting move. And, and I, there's, you know, obviously we're only seeing 
these four slides were not seeing the justification for how they came up with these concepts or hey maybe there's another part of this story that we're missing where they're going to sell an external drive for people who need that which is a, an eminently doable thing if they wanted to do it um and also what sort of stats do they have around xbox series x owners and do they use the disk drive on their console I can tell you with authority, I have never used the slot on my Xbox Series X. In fact, I just stuck the very first disc into my PlayStation 5 uh, last weekend. Weekend before last, I, I got a hold of a physical copy of Mortal Kombat 1 the day before digital codes went out. And so I cracked it open and put that disc in the drive. And that was, you know, this many years in and, and only because of a turn of, of uh, you know, of, of happenstance um, did I use that slot. And so do they have the data that says that's the common experience that more and more people are not using the slot? I like the option, um, especially in a situation like that, you know, like the, as my in, in a in a my line of work kind of uh, way. Um, having the option is, is very important. Um, so I, I would be curious to see if they end up doing something like, you know, because that's been the rumor for PlayStation five for a while is that they're also moving away from having a built in disc drive and that they are looking to go to more, something more of a clamp on disc drive an external drive that plugs in, which, you know, for all intents and purposes, who cares? Like, let's, let's think about it this way. If you haven't, if you haven't like used a console in a while, and, and maybe there's some of you out there that, that are, are in this group, or maybe just have never thought about it, but it's, it's fairly common knowledge. The games don't run off the disc anymore. They have not for a full generation and a half now. Um, putting a disc in a drive copies it to the hard drive. That's it. It's just like the digital version of the game. There is no, you know, there, there's, there's no difference other than you having a physical disc, which, you know, is a, is a difference that matters to, to some players, but in terms of, um, you know, so, so I guess what I'm saying is if people were ever worried about like, well, an external drive, that sounds like it'd be slower or what, you know, load times or this or that, you know, install times might suffer. I don't, but probably not actually over USB C, uh, an external drive would work just as well at copying that data to a hard drive and also telling the console, Hey, yes, this device is hooked up with this disc in the drive. You can run the application where we verified that they are, oh, they own it or they've recreated this disc drive in a very nefarious way to trick the console into thinking that there's a disc inside a drive over here. Maybe someday. Huh? 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 What do you think? Um, you know, if someone was going to do that, they would have done. Well, I don't know. People have done that. And anyway, <laughs> got an ODE in my 3DO. My 3DO thinks there's a drive attached, but really. Um, anyway, uh, yeah. So it, it's in, in terms of in, in, in plain terms, in terms of usability, in terms of, of, of all that sort of stuff, there's no difference between an external and an internal drive when it comes to playing games. So I think that that's a viable solution. But again, we don't know. Uh, there, the, none of that information is here. None of none of that in, info is part of the um, is part of these leaked documents. Like, will they have an external drive? It, I would think so. Just from a sensibility, just when you think about the Xbox story and the the pitch that they've always had about like, oh, the gamers love choice. And these gamers, they love choice. They love to choose. That's why they can choose between the cloud or not the cloud or an Xbox series X or an Xbox series S or what like their entire pitch has been about choice. So I think if they got to this, this beat, this moment in time and said, nah, son, no more discs. If you wanted to make a choice, you should have made a choice on the last on the Xbox we've been selling for the last few years. That seems, um, weird. 
Um, so we'll see. I don't know. I, I my expectation just from a a like again, um, a story perspective would would be to you know, to sell that external drive for people who want it. And that that's just something that's not included in these docs here. But, but again, it doesn't say that. So we can only really speculate, uh, based on, and again, a lot of that is based on the speculation around what Sony is going to do with an upgraded PlayStation five in terms of offer offering that, uh, external drive as an option. Um, I think the external drive option is actually a good one because let's face it. Like we're in, we're in this stopgap era right now for physical media. Um, we can sit here and pretend that like discs are going to last forever when it comes to video games. It's just not like we're going to get by the time. And, and maybe even by the time we get to the next set of consoles, by the time there's a PlayStation six and another Xbox, which we'll be talking about here in a minute. Uh, maybe it'll be that soon, but maybe it'll be another generation out, whatever it is. But we are in this stopgap era. Uh, and these boxes will eventually not have slots on them and there will not be discs sold in stores. And that's just how this is going to go. Um, we can sit here and debate about, well, people with data caps and people with this and people with that. It, it's, uh, yeah, I, I don't think that this is a, 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 a this is, this is not how it's going to go. I'm, uh, you know, I would be, um, I wonder if when Nintendo gets to issuing the next Switch, if they eventually sell one that doesn't have a cartridge slot on it. If they're eventually just like, hey, we can make them a little cheaper if we do this. And so let's do this, put a little extra internal storage in it or to balance out the price or, you know, whatever it is. I, I would not be shocked to see them start to kind of offer an all digital Switch 2 at some point next generation for them. But we'll see. Um so yeah, that's, that is probably the biggest, uh, or, or like most, uh, um, pressing information out of this, uh, Xbox leak stuff. Um, and the, the biggest actual new thing here is the controller, which <laughs> I love the advanced haptics stuff on paper. I love it when it is well implemented, uh, on the PlayStation five. But no one uses it. Third-party developers do not add features that you make good use of those of that technology. Uh, the first-party games use it because they have to, and 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 bless them for doing it. Because when it's when it is used well, it's really cool. It's really really neat. It's a really great. Uh, it it helps with immersion. It's it's a really fantastic, cool feeling thing. But third parties don't give a shit because they're like, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're making a PS five version. We're okay. We got to make an Xbox version. We got to make this. No, I'm not going to spare a team time to go come up with custom controller shit for the PlayStation five version. No one cares. And so they don't do it. Um, even on the Xbox, which does have, you know, currently has better haptics than, than is are often used. Like I, I was reminded playing that Forza Motorsport demo, I was like, oh, right, these triggers, they, this feels great. This is really nice. Oh, no games use this. Right, I forgot. No games use any of this stuff. They just use the basic rumble, and it's just the same rumbly shit that it's been for years, and, and no one thinks about it. So I'm of two minds of this, and I don't know which way it's going to go. On one hand, you could argue that Microsoft is late to the party on this, and they are adding features to their controller that no one actually uses or cares about. Like, hey, they've got advanced haptics and they can act as a speaker. Great. You know, the first thing I do on a PlayStation 5 game is turn off a controller speaker because I'm usually wearing headphones. Um, advanced haptics? Great idea. The market has spoken. No, no developers bother with that when it comes to the PlayStation 5. So fucking whatever. So years later, they've got a controller that is maybe going to match. You know, if we're reading this, like maybe it'll match feature for feature with some of the PS5 stuff. I, I don't know. It doesn't get into specifics about, you know, does it have triggers that can stick and lock and the way a PS5 does? It, it doesn't say anything about that. So maybe it's not exactly the same. Um, 
But again, it says precision haptic feedback and the haptics double as speakers. And they have, they've got an accelerometer, which, all right, whatever. Um, no one, no one fucking wants an accelerometer in their controller anymore. It's, it's a pain in the ass. I don't know. Maybe they're just like, well, the Fortnite kids need this. And maybe that's, maybe that's their thinking is like all these flick stick assholes demand accelerometers in their controller. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's just a, a, I don't know, but so there's that side of it. That's the one mind I have. The other mind I am of this is that maybe if they achieve parity with the PlayStation 5 developers will finally start giving a shit because both major console platforms will support it and the work doesn't go to waste on one whole platform. So maybe this is the thing that helps more PlayStation 5 games get better haptics as well. Because suddenly both consoles, both Xbox and PlayStation have it. It's a little more standardized or at least close if it's not identical to where they can go, oh, yeah, okay, we should start taking advantage of these advanced tactics because everyone playing games is going to have one of these controllers. If they don't now, they will soon. Um, and people on PC even will at some point too. So, you know, hey, maybe we should just do this. Um, and we'll see. I don't know. Until we can really get our hands, until we see the kind of public-facing announcement and get our hands on this updated Xbox controller, it's hard to know. Like, are they just fully matching? Is, is this just them matching the PlayStation 5 feature set? Or is this something different? We don't know. The bullet points on these leaked docs don't get specific enough for us to know. Um, so there's that. I would love it. L-O-V-E. I would love it if the release of this controller led to more developers taking better advantage of advanced haptics on controllers. Uh, no matter what the platform is. With the possible exception of HD Rumble on the Switch. Which 1-2 Switch already was the high water mark for that and uh, no one has done anything with it since. Um... <laughs> I would love it if this led to more widespread adoption of advanced haptics in games. That'd be cool. Uh, whether it's Xbox, whether it's PlayStation, if, if this just leads to developers just using that shit more often, that'd be fantastic. I would love that. Um, that would be the best case scenario out of this stuff. Um, but we'll see, you know, and maybe it's a different enough standard that it doesn't help anyone at all ever. Uh, who can say? Um, and then the controller uh, there's a new mobile app feature that will let you see what devices your controller is paired to and s for seamless pairing and switching between devices I, I'm not the sort of person who uses a controller with multiple devices it's just not how I live my life um, but that's a cool feature for people that, that do that um Oh, okay. What else? So there were also some documents. Uh, there was also some slides in, uh, in again, we're, we're discussing this stuff leaked out of the FTC and Microsoft, uh, case. Um, these are documents that were submitted for part of that trial that cover the, the future of the Xbox. Um, and so that's the near-term future, apparently. Again, and I will re repeat it here. It's worth repeating. This is all subject to change. We don't know when these documents were uh, were necessarily made. Um, I think they might have file names that imply... No, I guess not. No, they just have... Yeah, so some of these are, you know, potentially... Potentially late 2022... Uh, but some of them go as far back as 2020 as we, as we go through this. So we don't really, we don't really know if these are still the current plans, right? Um, all of this is subject to change, but some of the new console stuff seems like it would be far enough along. And some of it is far enough out that you can look at it and go like, okay, well, this is what they were thinking at some point. Um, and so they talk about the next Xbox uh, platform, 
which they just have an Xbox logo. It says the next generation Xbox. They've got a slide in here that says each, each generation of Xbox has also brought new innovations to Microsoft. And the original Xbox back in 2001, it was Xbox Live and DirectX innovation. For the Xbox 360, what did that bring to Microsoft? The Kinect. Digital media and store and game input. Those are, yes, of course. Uh, the Xbox One brought the Xbox security processor. Uh, game Pass and further innovation on DirectX. The uh, Series X and S generation that we are currently in. Project X Cloud, Direct Storage. DFA manufacturing. So I, I don't I don't know what DFA stands for, but uh death from death from above manufacturing. LCD sound system is building Xboxes in a bunker right now. That's why there hasn't been a new album. Um and uh and then we get to the next generation Xbox, which this document pegs as being available in the year 2028. So when Phil Spencer gives quotes like I feel like we're at the end of the beginning of the generation. That's what he's talking about because he's talking about a generation that is going to last five more years. Um, and so the innovations that they are, are pegging here for the next console would be immersive game and app platform, which to me starts to sound like a set top box of some kind and cloud hybrid games which is something that I think we've been talking about since um, Crackdown 3. Um, the, the very idea of games that run pow partially in the cloud and partially locally, I think for the right game, I think it makes a lot of sense. You know, your flight sims, your this, your that. Like there's plenty of cases to be made for that, that, that in the right circumstance, I think that Something like that could lead to new types of gamings, but that, that new types of gamings, he said, um, which brings us to the paragraph here that they've written about their vision for cohesive hybrid compute, which the slide says develop a next generation hybrid game platform capable of leveraging the combined power of the client and cloud to deliver deeper immersion and entirely new classes of game experiences. Optimized for real-time gameplay and creators, we will enable new levels of performance beyond the capabilities of the client hardware alone. Um, sure, yeah, why not? Uh, and, and this is something, you know, there was the, the, there was the pitch that Kojima supposedly had about a big crazy cloud game, and you know, like the, but if you think about it, And it's hard to think about it because I think it requires, you know, this is something that if done correctly, I, I think does lead to sort of a paradigm shift in the sort of things that are uh, capable or that we're capable of seeing running on consoles or running, running locally. Because if they can go off and process some things off the, bo off the box and have access to the cloud and process voice. You know, like, like even just like subtle, like, 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 let's start small. Let's start with something that sounds like something that would be, uh, uh, attainable or believable. Um, that's a situation where, okay, what if you had a game and this will not sound like a fun or good example, but it is something that I think is, is at least sort of an example. Um, the idea of a game that is generating AI dialogue on the fly. And it is generating the voice for that uh, dialogue in the cloud, shipping it down to your console. This is all stuff that actually, as things get more powerful, you know, we're getting to a point where a lot of that stuff can be run locally. And so, you know, this this sound maybe would have been a better example two or three years ago. But the basic idea of just like what are things that are too intensive to process locally? If they could process that in the cloud, or if they could connect a world together using their Azure servers or whatever in ways that lead to more shared connected environments, lead to larger worlds, lead to, um, you know, more connected environments, less, less load time between, uh, between areas and zones because you're just walking from one zone to the, what if world of Warcraft didn't have any load screens and you just walk to the entire, you know, uh, 
But you know what I mean? Like, like those, those sorts of kind of larger, um, larger experiences. And it's hard to fathom because, uh, you know, most of us don't make games and, uh, and most of us don't have access to this sort of stuff. But I think the idea of like, okay, Hey, we're really limited in what we can do with our AI in the game. Um, in terms of how reactive it is, in terms of how it's uh, responding to the player, because we only have so much CPU on the box to do it with. Um, and so the AI is not good at ducking. It doesn't do this. It doesn't, you know, when it's shooting back at you, it sucks and it does this. And, um, and it's like, okay, well, what if you could process all of that off the console and the console could be focused on stuff that really, really, really has to run client side uh, and you can have other parts of the game offloaded to these external CPUs existing somewhere across the internet. And so having to figure out like, oh, do we have to do this or we have to do that? You know, like, like you, you, that's, that's less of a thing or it becomes less of a, a processor power thing and more of a budgetary thing. Because if your game is hitting the cloud all the time, eventually that's probably going to be expensive. Uh... And are those costs coming down? Are cloud costs coming down? I don't know. Perhaps. Um, is Microsoft going to foot everyone's cloud bill? If someone comes along with a really ambitious uh, new Xbox game uh, and uh, and it hits the cloud all the time and 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 they're not public and Microsoft is not publishing it, are they going to pick up the third party tab on that? Are they going to go like, oh yeah, man? Just come in and use use our cloud, and that comes out of our thirty. You know, our thirty percent covers that. Or, or, or are they suddenly going to be like, hey, if you're making this many calls to our server per month for whatever, you've got to pay. You know, is, is that that is again another limitation for the people that are creating games. Um, someone in chat says they work in Azure a lot, and it is not cheap. So yeah, uh, you know, Microsoft gets friend prices when it comes to that shit, but. But yeah, it is still CPUs running in a facility somewhere. And uh, they, you know, does it become a situation where it's like, hey, if you want access to our cloud services, you definitely have to sign up for Xbox Live Gold. Uh, and you have to pay that, you know, are the users, are the user subscription fees going to, to, to foot that bill or something? Anyway, this is five years away. So uh, this is, some of this stuff may sound a little pie in the sky, but not that pie in the sky. Because again, these are conversations, the idea of a hybrid device or a hybrid game, because the device is whatever, you know, it's, it's any device theoretically could do it as long as it's powerful enough to run something client side. Um, but leveraging off, you know, off servers somewhere else, leveraging servers somewhere else to do that sort of stuff. Uh, what does that mean? What does that look like? How does that change games? Like, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to, to really nail it down. But it does sound a little bit like, you know, hey, when they were talking about Crackdown 3, the pitch was these physics are too crazy for us to run locally and too crazy for us to sync across a multiplayer match. Thus, we simply must run the physics in the cloud. And so everyone has synced up destructible buildings and whatever else. Forget about the part where Crackdown 3 was a bad fucking game and that stuff didn't really show well in the game itself. But conceptually, on paper, if you think about that as a, an example case you can start to think about other things that might, if, if this technology were to work, what that might actually look like. And five years is a long time uh, for that stuff to, you know, what's left of it to get figured out, to get figured out. Um, we'll see. There's, uh, there's bits in here where there, you know, th there are decisions they have yet to make because they're, you know, again, a minimum of five years out. This may be a year old at this point. So this could be six or seven year old data at this point, but they are talking about the idea of like decisions they would have to make around CPU. Do they stick with their kind of X64 architecture? Do they go with an arm processor instead, which would be a big deal. Um, balancing the big versus little CPU cores, uh, GPU. Are they going to co-design something with AMD? Or are they just going to license an existing AMD part? Um, and figuring out some of the machine learning. They have a, a graphics innovation tab here where the, the listing is, the lists are just next gen direct X ray tracing, dynamic global illumination, 
micro polygon rendering optimizations, machine learning based super resolution, like a DLSS kind of thing. Uh, or I guess super resolution would be like a, is that a DLA? Anyway, uh, and an extensibility model for faster iteration and innovation. Um, so it sounds like the, the basic idea would be, you know, Hey, are, are there ways for us to offload? Like, let's, let's make a, let's make a decently powerful box for sure. But also let's make sure we're building something in that is going to be able to take advantage of things that are happening off the console somewhere else on the internet that it is pulling from and pulling into game. Um, which not every game needs to use. Obviously, uh, I don't think this, this wouldn't be a situation. So, so that means that they would have to have a relatively powerful client side thing because you'll have, you'll still have things like fighting games, um, that you're not going to want to render part of it in the cloud and add a bunch of latency to it. Like there are good, there are latency sensitive games that where the, you're just, there are certain aspects that you will definitely have to be rendering client side. Um, and you know, if you're rendering backgrounds in a fighting game in the cloud, who cares? I guess. But, uh, the physics of some guy walking in the background, holding a bunch of boxes and he drops the boxes and oh no. And the physics are too intense. We've got to offload that. Uh, maybe who knows? I don't know. That's again, it's difficult to think of like great examples here, but, uh, there's another slide here for key technological enablers for this vision cloud to edge architecture across Silicon graphics, not Silicon graphics, but Silicon comma graphics and OS enabling ubiquitous play. I love ubiquity. I love to get ubiquitous with it. Uh, some say I'm the most ubiquitous motherfucker in the game. Um, but yeah, cloud to edge architecture. So something that is again, built to take advantage of this stuff very natively and, and very streamlined. Um, like, like making that pipeline as uh, efficient as they possibly can. So when they do have to call stuff out, it's when they do have to pull stuff from uh, from the server side, that it is done efficiently and as quickly as they can. Uh, AI and machine learning enablement, optimization and acceleration of game performance operations and development for players and creators. That's a that's a great nothing bullet point there of just like yeah, an optim acceleration of game performance. Yeah, we want we want AI and machine learning to uh, make stuff better. Is what they're saying. Um. And creator platform, open and extensible game and immersive app development platform. So yeah, that's what they've been wanting all along. Um, and then they break out some of the AI and machine learning stuff into kind of individual bits that maybe will help you uh, envision how some of this stuff might work. Creator efficiency, they have listed here. And, and they have these broken up into things they currently do things that are in proof of concept phase and then things that are fertile future ideation. Meaning things they're just like, we could probably do this by 2028. <laughs> We're not doing it now, but I mean, there are only two things on the card that are in that, that camp. But, um, I don't know, like uh, there's people in the chat that are just like, there's, there's none of this means anything. Like what, what did you, have you ever worked for a company before? Have you ever worked? Have you ever like sat through a pitch deck and, and, like this is re remember that this pitch deck is associated with like a two hour long meeting where someone is sitting there t telling you about it, that someone is sitting there talking to you about how it works, that someone is sitting there. Like there's a whole chunk of context that we don't have because we were not in the meeting where this was presented, you know? Um, so these are things that just like, when you look at them, they look like shit but they're deliberately meant to be high level concepts because someone is there talking you through it or, or you are there talking a team through it. Um, so I, I guess that's my way of saying none of this seems out of the ordinary to me, a person who has sat in a lot of fucking meetings. Um, and, and you look at it and go like, yeah, I, I see why you would do this. Some of this is like far fetched, but again, they're talking about things that are maybe six years out seven, you know, who knows when this, when this deck was even made. Uh, so there's some things in here when this, again, this is stuff that they think would be powered by AI and machine learning. 
support services, personalization and discovery, safety and toxicity. Some of this is stuff that like, you know, Call of Duty just rolled out some kind of AI based chat, like voice chat monitoring where they can, uh, you know, monitor your chat. And if you're being super shitty, they will voice ban you or, you know, or worse, if you if you are a repeat offender, um, that's a pretty easy one. That's a pretty low level, like, you know, Xbox Live could do that right now if they, you know, were able to just like listen in on the servers or, or whatever. Like that's that's not something that's very far fetched at all. And that is something that, again, machine learning and AI is something that helps kind of make that stuff faster and smoother and probably work worse, but hey, um, creator efficiency is this is stuff they think will help developers. Um, AI game testing, which I, I don't know, there are there are um, AI game testing is a weird thing because there are cases where people are building test beds and test cases and, and having machines test themselves and 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 all of that sort of stuff. Um, that's something that sort of does happen today, and that is you know again I, I think something they're listed as a research and proof of concept. So that's, that's stuff that's, you know, automated QA has, has been around for a long time. What they're basically talking about is like, what if we built this in at the platform level and uh, made it so something could some, any, any developer of any size could leverage this um, procedural content generation, which, you know, people have had to build engines for that sort of stuff. And Maybe now you could offload your procedural stuff into the cloud and get better results back because you've got more CPU to fuck around with or faster results. Who knows? Physics and inverse kinematics. Yeah, games have been doing IK for a long time. Um, machine learning and stuff like that. Could it lead to better results? Sure. Why not? Um, dialogue generation. It says NLP dialogue generation. I don't know. I, I, I feel like I've seen the acronym NLP before, but... Um, yeah, dialogue generation. That's what we talked about. Is like, what if you and, and um, I'll point. I'll point. Out, hey, if you're on TikTok, uh, you should you should uh, natural language processing. Bryn, thank you. Yes. Um, uh, Chet Fauzek from uh for Stray Bombay, whom uh, they're they're making the Anacrusis. Uh, he's got a TikTok account where he talks a lot about the processes they've been going through when it comes to making their game and just extolling his views on game development and. And all of that sort of stuff. It's been an interesting... He's got some interesting uh, takes there on TikTok. And he had something recently to say about AI-generated dialogue that I guess I hadn't really thought about, but it makes a lot... Of, the, the idea of just like... Basically, the question he was asking is like, is that what you want? Like, just a bunch of dialogue that goes fucking nowhere? And this... Like, do you want to have robust but meaningless conversations with every single... NPC in Starfield or Skyrim. And in those, the examples he uses is like games. He just, he doesn't want to talk to any of those fucking people. Cause none of them have, have anything interesting to say. Like all of these people will just talk in circles because the main storyline will be still written by humans. And maybe you could get a slightly better, slightly better low level AI, like, like low level NPC dialogue is not a thing that games actually need. Um, anyway, uh, he's a, he's an interest. He's a good follow. Go check him out. Um, for live ops, things like monetization, improvement, engagement, and retention management. So, you know, better stats like, you know, th that's analytics is a huge, uh, obviously, you know, you don't need me to tell you, you probably don't need, you probably don't need to need me to tell you that analytics and monitoring what players do and don't do in games is huge business and every every publisher out there has a team of people that are pulling apart the data in as many different ways as they can whether that's data coming from inside the games or data coming from purchasing and 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 seeing what the competition is doing and and you know trying to put it all together and make sense about what they need to do to get more people to play their games um so using machine learning or, or having machine learning built in early enough in the process of the entire console that enables them to leverage that in some way. Like, yeah, I, I see why, I see why that might matter. Um, in game experiences, they're saying like matchmaking and player ranking could be done better if it was done by AI and machine learning. I, maybe, I don't know that, that, that seems like a weird one. Uh, but then, you know, in terms of game performance, um, they could use machine learning to better compensate for latency when they're streaming stuff out of X cloud. 
Uh, and of course, there's the uh, neural network super resolution stuff, like the stuff that NVIDIA has been doing uh, with DLSS. So that's, you know, then when they just think about like, here's stuff we could do if we had better AI and machine learning, either client side or server side, a lot of it is, is the stuff you would expect. Um, and, and a few kind of long shots that you're just like, yeah, maybe, maybe that would help with di generating dialogue or, you know, maybe that would help with QA in some weird way. Maybe, um, but this is all stuff. I, I feel like the, the ideation here that they're doing around what they want the next Xbox to see is also the stuff that they talked a lot about when it came time for things they could do with the Xbox One and things they could do with the Xbox Series X. You know, these are not new ideas. It is more that they have had these ideas for a long time and there hasn't really been a need for it. Um, and, and I don't know, you know, like, I don't know if there is still a need for it. It's getting closer. It feels like a little bit of like, oh yeah, I guess like this stuff seems more attainable in terms of like leveraging uh, server side assets uh, and and server server side resources uh, for a game um, that could be cool if used properly. I I don't you know I would love to talk to a developer that has like very firm ideas about how that would make their game better. That's a conversation that I think that they're going to need to have at some point as they start pitching this sort of stuff. Um, is like, how is this actually making games better and, and in real terms? And, and that's the sort of stuff that they have about five years to figure out is how do we actually pitch this in a way that makes it sound really cool? Um, how do we, how do we, how do we pitch this? How do, how do we let people know that this is actually making their games deeper and more interesting, uh, that are making their things more robust um, in ways that will matter to them and how do, how do developers, uh, leverage this stuff in ways that help the people playing games or, 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 or make things more enjoyable for the people playing games. Uh, if it's enough to, you know, if, if, if these sorts of tools help developers make games faster, make games better and, and those sorts of things, then maybe that ends up being enough for them to, you know, like for this to be the pitch or something. But at the end of the day, um, you know, we're, we're talking about a world where now 100% of games are online, right? Always online. Uh, which, much like I was talking about with the lack of a drive slot on future consoles, that is something we will probably also see in our lifetimes, right? Regardless of game. Um, So that's pretty much what they're saying about what the next Xbox will be. Again, it's all really early concepts and, and, and whatever else, but like, um, I don't know. None of it seems particularly far-fetched. You, you, again, like this, this feels like the kind of updated version of the pitch, uh, the updated version of the crackdown three pitch. It feels like close, something closer to the real version of the crackdown three pitch of just like, Hey, we can do this. And in addition, maybe it helps them, Maybe they don't have to make a console that is as powerful as uh, that it is as 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 cutting edge as they have had to if they can guarantee that a lot of this stuff is offloaded. Maybe they're like, okay, well, if we can guarantee that we can offload this, 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 and this, then maybe we get away with an ARM processor here. Maybe we get away with a GPU that does this, but not this. And, you know, there's there's different things like that 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 they can play around with. Um which, you know, in a world where you still have to make a console that probably costs somewhere around $500. Um, you know, you got to figure all that stuff out. And remember that they are also the company that is pitching the idea of, um, you know, streaming games, you know, completely from the cloud, you know, as, as an option for some players and as, as something that, that may be a dominant way for people to play games in the future. Um, I will again say that's not a future I'm especially interested in uh, for certain types of games, but for some types of games that would work fine. You know, role-playing games, turn-based this, and you know, games that are not super latency dependent, 
even if you are using machine learning for latency compensation, there are certain aspects of that that are only going to work so well. Um, so we'll see. Uh, another document, uh, that leaked out was a pretty old, well, yeah, this is a, it's a document of Bethesda's release schedule, uh, that goes all the way up through fiscal year 24, but starts at fiscal year 20, implying that perhaps this game, this, uh, document was, you know, from before the acquisition or something they were looking at as they were getting ready to acquire Bethesda. Like, like basically just like, all right, we're getting ready to buy Bethesda. We need to know what's in their pipeline. Let's take a look at it. And so, you know, starting at 2020, we have things like death loop and doom eternal. Um, for fiscal year 21, they had Starfield in there. Didn't quite make it. Did not quite make it. Um, as well as uh, Project Hibiki, which I think we understand to be Hi-Fi Rush, um, also targeted for 2021. Ghostwire Tokyo Redfall for 21, which is, I guess, not that far off because we're talking about fiscal years, not not calendar years. For fiscal 22, they've got Indiana Jones and Oblivion remaster. Yeah, so let's just talk about the things that we are, uh, you know, that we don't necessarily already know about or things that are not necessarily out. They got the Indiana Jones game on here for fiscal 22. Uh, a remaster of Oblivion, Starfield DLC. Um, and then for fiscal year 23, there's something on here that says Doom Year Zero. So could that be the next project from id Software? Could they be working on a, a Doom prequel? Is that what that is? Um, we don't know something that is referred to as project Kestrel, another elder scrolls online. There's always another elder scrolls online expansion. Yeah. The doom prequel is just doom. They made it's, it's the, yeah, you, know, you are, what is, what did doom? It's just like, what did doom guy do before, uh, before there were all these hell demons and Martian, whatever, whatever. And it's just like, it's a fucking barbecue grill simulator. And you're just like, oh, yeah, all right. You just flip burgers. And you have a great time. Um, something called Project Platinum. For fiscal year 24, we've got Licensed IP Game. A remaster of Fallout 3. A sequel to Ghostwire Tokyo. Dishonored 3. And Elder Scrolls Six. Um, which that that's you know again these were all this these are very old dates. None of those are going to hit those dates. None of those are going to. But we can look at it at least and go like, well, this is probably you know th th there's some portion of of this that is uh, probably still the roadmap for Bethesda's studios. Dishonored three would make a lot of sense. Um, a Ghostwire Tokyo sequel perhaps makes less sense. Uh, I think a Fallout three re remaster and an Oblivion remaster. I think those are cool ideas and I think that they should do that. <laughs> um, licensed IP game. They should do that. Elder Scrolls six. They should probably do. I guess, I guess they should do that. Um, do you think that, um, has Starfield has the release of Starfield, um, changed your viewpoint on, uh, what you like, like your desire for a new elder scrolls game? I guess is, is my question. Does it, it, it does it, 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 ma it makes you want it more or seeing Starfield and seeing the ways in which it does not evolve the formula. Has it, has it made you go, Oh, right. They're just going to make this game forever. Um, 
we could start to get our expectations up and say, well, maybe Elder Scrolls Six will be the grand departure from the formula where they really actually make dramatic change, but I would have thought that Starfield, the game they were pitching as the first new IP in 25 years, the we're going to space, we're making things, this is all, the, like, I would have thought that that would have been the game that was more of a departure from the standard type of game they make. Um, and so I, yeah, I don't know. I kind of, um, yeah, Starfield kind of put me in a, in a, in a zone where I'm like, yeah, no, I, I do like these games, but the distance at which they need to be spread apart is getting greater and greater because there are just so many other games coming out that like this is I don't necessarily want to <laughs> I don't necessarily feel like I have to play another one of these um but by the time uh, Elder Scrolls 6 comes out maybe I will be like yeah I could actually yes I'm ready for another one of these fantasy themed huh hmm. you got dragons in there or no no dragons can I fuck a dragon can I fuck a dragon can I fuck a dragon, can I fuck a dragon? Hmm? um no new Fallout on this list. In fact, uh, no Fallout 76 uh, expansions on this list either. They've got Elder Scrolls Online expansions listed one per year all the way out until the end of frickin' time. Um, and it looks like Project Platinum is a uh, corresponds to that big NVIDIA leak and that that would be a machine games project, which I guess would be the thing they would do after Indiana Jones? Is that the... Eh? Um, who the heck knows? Um, so yeah, that that's there's a look at the Bethesda roadmap a little bit. And that's kind of all of the forward-looking stuff. Uh, there's a few interesting emails here. Um, someone in chat says, No new gears? Remember, this is just the Bethesda slate. This is not the full-on Xbox Game Studios slate. Um... So, you know, it, it's the, the, we don't have, you know, the, the, this document does not cover whatever the, the Microsoft studios are, are working on. Um, there's one email here from one Phil Spencer responding to, uh, someone at Microsoft named Takeshi Nomoto. And this is from August of 2020. And so this is, uh, to set the stage for some of this time frame, remember that at a point Microsoft was um, potentially on the hook to acquire TikTok when the United States government was, for whatever reason, turning up the heat on, uh, on TikTok and saying TikTok is the, the every you know the, the the Chinese are are infiltrating our kids and 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 TikTok's data is going back to China and we can't we cannot allow a Chinese company to to run TikTok to own TikTok because of the uh, the implications and 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 we're still seeing some of that stuff. You see like governments saying like well, you are not allowed to install TikTok on government owned devices and um and so. For a while there, the there was a push from the government to say you are going to have to sell um like the US part of TikTok to a US owned company um if you want to continue to operate in this country. We are not going to allow ByteDance to continue to operate TikTok in this country. And so Oracle was the company I think that eventually stepped up and looked like they were pretty much on the hook to buy TikTok. Uh, but there were a lot of other companies in the running for that, and Microsoft was one of them. Uh, this th That happened then. That was stuff that was discussed back around that time, because the government was just like, they were, that was their latest witch hunt. Like, I'm, like the TikTok is ruining, you know, and, and then Trump tried to ban TikTok. And you know, there was just like all this, you know, just cornball fucking stupid shit from a government that doesn't even know what the fuck phones fucking do trying to ban shit they don't understand. I'm not saying TikTok is good. I'm saying that regardless of the goodness or badness of TikTok, uh, 
which it probably leans bad. Um, I am going to say the United States government doesn't know what the fuck they're talking about. So they're still kind of on this. They're, they're still like, like little bits and pieces about the government going after TikTok, but that was hot and heavy. Uh, for a while there. And and like I said, there were multiple U S based companies that were like, well, fuck man, we'll buy fucking TikTok. shit. I, yeah. If they have to sell it, like, yeah, shit, we'll own TikTok. Fuck it. Um, and so this, these, this email exchange comes at a time when they were talking about that. And so we don't have the full exchange here. We have an email from a Chris, uh, Capacella at Microsoft. Um, kind of talking about like this TikTok acquisition and saying like, oh, TikTok has really fallen into our lap rather than being something we actively sought out for our consumer business. If you said, what is the next best consumer asset that we should spend 10 billion to 30 billion on? I don't think we'd say it's TikTok, but the stars have aligned to give us a chance. So we should look hard at pursuing it. And he goes on a little bit there from there. And then this email kind of ends, um, but it seems like the conversation was basically someone saying, Hey, TikTok is good, uh, and all, but, um, what about Nintendo? Um, someone maybe, you know, kind of outside of the gaming leadership saying, Hey, what about these other brands? Um, what about, what about these other consumer assets? And so we have a response from one Phil Spencer to an email that we can't see as a part of this chain. Uh, responding to Takeshi Nomoto, and he says, Takeshi, I totally agree that Nintendo is the prime asset for us in gaming, and today gaming is our most likely path to consumer relevance. So that says to me this email was about them saying, like, what are the most relevant, what could be we be acquiring that would be consumer-facing in ways that are not Windows? You know, obviously, you know, they've they got Xbox, that's a consumer-facing brand, and that's one of their only consumer-facing brands. Like, they're not doing... Like, didn't they kind of run away from the surface stuff again? Like they don't make a lot of hardware anymore uh, as much as they perhaps used to. And so the number of brands that Microsoft has out there in the marketplace, you know, Xbox is by and far the, the biggest one. So, so this is, yeah, LinkedIn. Sure. LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Um, I've had numerous conversations with the LT and Nintendo about tighter collaboration and feel like if any U S company would have a chance with Nintendo, we are probably in the best position. The unfortunate or fortunate for Nintendo situation is that Nintendo is sitting on a big pile of cash. They have a board of directors that until recently has not pushed for further increases in market growth or stock appreciation. I say until recently as our former Microsoft board of directors member value act has been heavily acquiring shares of Nintendo and I've kept in touch with Mason Morfitt, who I assume is someone at this value act company as, as he's been acquiring, it's likely he will be pushing for more from Nintendo stock, which could create opportunities for us without that catalyst. I don't see an angle to a near term, mutually agreeable merger of Nintendo and Microsoft. And I don't think a hostile action would be a good move. So we're playing the long game, but our board of directors has seen the full write up on Nintendo and valve, which is the little throwaway bit in there. Um, and they are fully supportive on either if the opportunity arises as am I. So let's, let's, there's more to this email, but like, this is just a, this is just an email that someone sent in business. This is just like marketing and acquisitions doing their thing of just like, yeah, they're aware of what the competitors in the space are. They're aware of who's, who's, who, who's what. And this is basically Phil Spencer saying like, yeah, we can't buy Nintendo right now. Uh, we're look, I mean, we're always keeping an eye on it because if the opportunity arrives, shit, man, we would love to do it, but he's basically saying like, no, it's a long shot. It's if it, if it comes into view, then maybe, but it's not like, like, yes, we're aware of Nintendo's current market cap. We're aware of this. We're aware of that. We're, you know, th but there's nothing there. That's like, we are actively pursuing an acquisition of Nintendo. This is more of a larger conversation about consumer facing acquisitions that Microsoft could be making uh, in the context of someone looking at the TikTok acquisition and going like, is this, is this how we should spend this money or should we get something like an intent, you know, like some other big consumer brand? 
Like, what, what else is there? And so this is like Phil Spencer kind of chiming in as the expert on the the subject, going like, yeah, we're aware. Of, yeah, we we're, it's not they're not in a they're not in a, in, a, in, a, in a they're not in a position to be easily acquired right now. But yeah, that would be cool. Um, <laughs> it's yeah, it's, it's basically like this email boils down to him saying like, yeah, it'd be rad if we own Nintendo. Um, which for my yeah for them it absolutely would. Um. There's another paragraph here that's kind of a diversion here, but you know, the, the email ends with saying, I love this, this discussion and value you looking at the opportunities here, which sounds like a minor blow off to me. It's like, Hey, thanks for looking. Uh, we've got this. I'm going to now, now I am going to look up, um, Takeshi Numoto here and see who this is. Uh, Takeshi Nomoto is, it is forcing me to solve a CAPTCHA before I can look at this LinkedIn profile here. Let's turn the sheep this way. You've proven you're a human. Continue your action. So he, uh, Takeshi Nomoto is executive vice president and commercial chief marketing officer at Microsoft. So he's not in the gaming division. This is a senior Microsoft person going like, what, a, what about this other thing? And then Phil Spencer going like, yeah, you're, yeah, that would be cool, dog. That, that would rip. Not going to happen, but that'd be badass. Thank you for, hey, yeah, th hey thanks. Um, thanks for the tip. Uh, anyway, I love this discussion and value you looking at the opportunities here. At some point, getting Nintendo would be a career moment. And I honestly believe a good move for both companies. It's just taking a long time for Nintendo to see that their future exists off their own hardware. A long time. Smiley face. Phil Spencer puts noses in his smiley faces, in case you were wondering. Uh, which means he's a demon. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, this to me is, it's like, it, to call it a blow off is to maybe be a little brutal, but it it is more just like yeah dude if we could get nintendo that'd be great and i and i really do think that and and he's basically saying like yeah it would it would be a good move if we if we, if we had nintendo and we could probably do more with nintendo and 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 you know help grow nintendo help get nintendo's products in front of more people blah 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 which of course you're going to say that um you're not going to say like ah we're fucked but but also the sentence, it's just taking a long time for Nintendo to see that their future exists off their own hardware. I don't fully disagree with that. Not in a, like, Mario should be on the Xbox kind of way, like, but um, could Nintendo be leveraging their things, their games in a, in a larger way? Probably. Um... You know, they're out there working on the Switch too, and, and we're having conversations like, uh, it's probably gonna be about a PlayStation 4's level of capability and whatever else. If Nint if Nintendo was in a position where they put their products out on multiple platforms, they could you know, they could have more visually pleasing video games. They could have their games in more places, they could have their games in the cloud, which is obviously a, a an area where they're not gonna be able to get to on their own. Um, and so if you think about the long-term 10-year plan of where all this stuff goes, it's very easy to see why a Phil Spencer would say that. Um, I would say I also believe that Nintendo's future exists off their own hardware. I would also say that Xbox's future exists off of its own hardware. And I would say that PlayStation's future exists off of its own hardware. If we extend this out long enough, if we really think about the next 10 years, um, then I do think that we get to a point where, yeah, these consoles probably still exist in some way, shape, or form. If the cloud infrastructure, if the speed of the internet, if the speed of, if the speed of light gets a little better, no, if the, you know, if they get better at this sort of, uh, whether it's mobile game uh, hardware, whether it's cloud infrastructure, all that sort of stuff, there is still that larger audience of people. 
that are never going to buy a $500 Xbox that are never going to, you know, that are, might not even buy a, a $300 switch, but they'll have a phone, but they'll have a smart TV, but they'll have this. They will have some other screen that given the right infrastructure could be playing a ton of different video games. I'm, and, and the, the thing you need to do is you need to remove yourself from the part that says, yeah, but the games won't be good. Like that's not, this is not the conversation that they're having. They're having, can we get these video games in front of a billion people? That's the big Microsoft cloud gambit. It's the, Hey, can we, can we fucking like, there are a lot of people out there that already kind of don't care about owning a console. Um, could we still get them to buy and play our games in some way, shape or form? Even if they're not ideal ways to play the games, these people clearly wouldn't fucking know the difference. Um, so let's run it in the cloud. And if done properly, that can work. If done properly, that can appeal to a wider audience. There's just a lot of hurdles. Apple doesn't want it on the platform. Google did it and failed, but Google Google's mistakes were more about the way they treated developers, the way they treated their own platform, the idea that they were selling the games and they were only available on the cloud. It's why the current hybrid approach that Microsoft has makes a lot more sense, but there's no reason. So, so I guess like my point is keep these comments in context. You're probably going to see a lot of news articles today that say in 2020, Microsoft wanted to buy Nintendo. Yeah, okay, sure. In 2023, Microsoft would love to buy Nintendo. Every year for the last 20 years, Microsoft would have loved to buy Nintendo. And for the next 10, they would probably love to buy Nintendo. Is this them actively working on an acquisition back in 2020? Is this them plotting and scheming to work on that that uh, that acquisition? No. This is someone outside of the gaming group asking a question about Nintendo's availability and the head of gaming writing back and being like, yeah, that'd be great. It, it's, not, it's not currently likely to happen. It's not something we're actively working on for, and here are a few reasons why. Love, love that you're thinking about this though. Um, I'm going to take a quick break because I think the front door might be locked and I will be back in a sec. Well, it looks like my daughter has figured out how to lock the front door and managed to lock my wife out as they were coming back from the grocery store. It's an interesting development that I'm sure will have months and months of repercussions. Oh boy. Um, anyway, th this email is kind of nothing. <laughs> um, and, and you're, you're going to see it going around a lot. Uh, with a lot of sensational headlines. I think I already saw a couple this morning. Um, and it, it's, you know, this is just, as I say pretty frequently, everyone is always thinking about buying everyone. Um, even conversations are happening all the time, you know, like Nintendo and Valve have spoken in the last couple of years about ac acquisitions. Probably not, but they keep in touch, even though they don't currently do business together. Nintendo and Microsoft, like these companies talk all the time. They're always looking for something. And, you know, uh, I think, again, I, I think the, the very idea of Nintendo getting its games onto more platforms is a bigger potential moneymaker for them than this current mentality of selling their own hardware and all. It's working great for them. Don't get me wrong. Like there, there's no reason for them to change. 
Um, I'm not sitting here going like, the Switch is a failure and they've got to rush to the cloud if they've got to put their games on an Xbox or they're doomed. It's nothing ridiculous like that. It is just the kind of capitalism ass type shit of like, well, everyone's going to try to make the most money possible. And um, yeah, I don't know if they eventually end up putting their games out onto cloud services or onto some other piece of hardware or whatever. Um, it's maybe not the worst idea in the world. They could still sell their own dedicated device. Fuck it. Who cares? Why not? Um... And then the middle chunk of this email is actually uh, interesting in the context of where 2020 is at. Uh, because it's it's separate and it's not about Nintendo, but we'll go back to it here. Confidentially, we have two fairly active M&A discussions in gaming right now. Warner Brothers Interactive and ZeniMax. I took ZeniMax to the board of directors last week and prior to the discussion... I asked Amy and, and Satya if they wanted me to slow either. So this is in the context of like, uh, you know, after the TikTok stuff surfaced, he went back to, you know, his bosses at Microsoft and said, should I back off on the Warner or ZeniMax stuff if we're going to spend all this TikTok money or, uh, and they both emphatically told me, no, they are fine doing all three of these if the deals make sense. I won't say Warner Brothers or ZeniMax is Nintendo, but both are for sale and gettable by us if things align. So this is actually, the, so we heard this, but I don't know that I've necessarily seen it written out like this. The biggest obstacle in Warner Brothers is IP ownership. We wouldn't own any of the IP, which hurts long-term flexibility. And the only obstacle on ZeniMax is valuation expectations of founders. So the, the founders of ZeniMax want more money than Microsoft wanted to pay. Uh, but I think it's likely that one or both of these happen, which will help us continue to double down on our gaming relevance. To give a sense of scale, ZeniMax is about the size of our current first-party studios org, so that would be doubling our content asset. Downside is that it's more core, less broad, not mobile, more North American and European, etc. Um... So, yeah, I mean, the WB stuff was stuff that I think everyone suspected and, ever, you know, kind of heard about the idea of like, uh, you know, maybe Microsoft picks up Warner. But if they wouldn't own any of the IP and, and we don't have the full context here, we, we does this mean obviously they would not own any of the Warner based IP, but would they take Warner's gaming IP or was Warner really shopping their studios around and saying, no, you won't own Paperboy. No, you won't own Robotron. No, you won't own Mortal Kombat. No, you won't own Spy Hunter. No, you like, like, was Warner really trying to hold on to every single piece of IP they owned? Or was it a case where they're like, obviously you won't own Batman, dumbass. Like, no one would ex go into this expecting that they would own Batman. But if I was going into a conversation saying, let's buy Warner Brothers gaming properties, I would expect to come out of that sale owning Mortal Kombat and owning all of the legacy Midway IP. If not, you're just buying buildings and people. And if you want buildings and people, but no IP, you don't buy it from Warner. You get on a plane, you go out to Chicago, you sit down with Sean Himmerich and Ed Boone and you go like, Hey, what if you guys left and started your own studio across the street and we funded it? And then what if you hired, uh, I don't know, everybody who works here that you'll, that you except for the people you don't like or whatever, like, you know, well, why don't you do this? Uh, so like going and buying, you know, buying Warner brothers interactive and not getting any IP, you're not getting anything. You're again, you're getting buildings, you're getting people, you're getting tech, which, you know, that's, that's not nothing. Um, but you would probably be better off taking the studios you cared about, whether that's a monolith or, you know, and, and going to the, going to people and having some very quiet conversations about like, Hey, are you well liked here? Like, I mean, if you left and then opened up a bunch of positions would a lot of the people who worked here, would they, would they apply and, and come with you? At least your senior leadership team, at least, you know. Like, if they went to another realm and said, like, could we get everybody that's on the first two pages of the credits of Mortal Kombat 1? Like the answer is, like, probably. 
And they'd have to do it in a, you know, you have to do it in kind of a sly way, I guess. Uh, I, maybe you do, maybe you don't. I don't know. Um, I don't know if there's legalities around that sort of stuff. Uh, but, you know, you could approach the heads of a studio and being like, what if you started a new studio? Because the alternative is like they're trying to sell you and you won't own Mortal Kombat anymore anyway. So what if you did this and controlled your own destiny and we paid you instead of paying Warner? Um, so yeah, I don't know. Uh, the, the, you know. Yeah, it, 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 it is a dicey proposition at some point because yeah, there is some element of poaching and there is some element of are you using company time to poach people and the employment law? And, you know, there's, there's ways that that could be tangled up, especially if you've already engaged Warner in acquisition conversations to then go and do this behind their back would be a bad look. Um, but would it be doable? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and that's kind of the last piece of the, the, the big, Microsoft news, I guess. Um, interesting stuff. I mean, again, we, a lot of this could be completely out of date and, and there's no guarantee that, um, that all of these things will come to pass, but the, the near term stuff around a new controller, um, and an updated Xbox series X, that sounds believable. That sounds like something that would still be in the works. I think that, uh, and again, you know, I think some people have tried to interpret this as Phil Spencer said they weren't going to do a mid-gen refresh and now they're leaking about a mid-generation refresh. Um, no, this is a different type of device. It's not, you know, they're not creating a new piece of hardware that all of his conversation around that stuff was very specifically around, oh, if we have five different uh platforms that people have to make games for and so this one is 14 teraflops and this one's 12 and this one's 10 and then and you know, we got a 22 coming out you know like that that becomes complicated for developers to support that all holds true this xbox series x they're talking about selling next year is not more powerful than the existing one it is the same box just with a faster you know like improved wireless stuff which I mean, honestly, that's what the Xbox 360 pipeline looked like, right? At some point they were like, all right, we're going to sell this Wi-Fi adapter. You can clip onto the back of your console. Isn't that cool? And then one day they were like, yo, what if this was just built in? Yo, 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 yo. What if we put out one of these that had an HDMI port on the back and it was black and sick? Um, so this is more in line with those sorts of improvements as opposed to you know, a, a PlayStation five pro and Xbox series X pro, uh, you know, wh whatever, whatever you want to say. So, so I, I, you know, I, I think the head headlines about Phil Spencer breaking his word are deliberately misinterpreting this and headlines about, uh, Microsoft buying Nintendo, um, are written by bad people. No, they're not necessarily bad people. Hey, everyone's got to keep their jobs. It's a bad, it's a bad, uh, market out there. Don't fault if someone's out there writing bad headlines because they want people to click on their articles. It sucks. But uh, hey, this, this, this people got to keep fucking food on the table. They're not. This, they got to keep their bosses happy. That they, they got to keep from getting fired. And that means giving a shit about SEO. The bane of our existence. It always was. I try to, I, I, uh, I, uh, you know, not to soapbox here. I, I always tried to make, uh, I tried to make the things that I make for people as opposed to robots, which is, uh, you know, it's, <laughs> we're seeing how well that worked out. Whatever. It's working out fucking great. I don't fuck it. <laughs> I don't have to, I don't have to fucking even pretend to care about any of that shit anymore. Um, not that I did before. Maybe that's, yeah, you know, Hey. I was in a lot of meetings saying like basically that type of shit and being like, yeah, who gives a shit about SEO? Oh, you have a whole department of people that just give a shit about SEO. Wow. How does it, how's it feel to have jobs where you try to please a robot that you can't fucking like a black box robot that is like 
fucking i don't know we've got to manage seo and google is always changing the algorithm so we don't know what it likes today whoops we redesigned the site and 30 percent of our traffic disappeared everyone's fired we've got ai writing the articles now i hope that's okay oh it's not okay well check this out too bad anyway activision took a meeting in december um, this is, I guess, yeah, okay. So this is, this is another set of emails that leaked out of the same leak. Um, Activision took a briefing on the upcoming switch hardware. The switch NG is how they refer to it in the doc. This doc is actually mad redacted. And so we don't get to see, um, the true good stuff, but there are a few emails here that, uh, Bobby Kodak is on along with, uh, Chris. Schnakenberg, who is the head of Activision's platform strategy and partner relations, according to The Verge. Um, but the, the I guess the one little tidbit here is, given the closer alignment to Gen 8 platforms in terms of performance and our previous offerings on PlayStation 4 and Xbox One, it is reasonable to assume we could make something compelling for the NG Switch as well. It would be helpful to secure early access to development hardware prototypes and prove that out nice and early. Uh, so this is kind of like a summary of like, hey, we met with Nintendo and here's what's going on that was sent to the higher ups at Activision. And then this got entered into evidence as part of this FTC trial um, and uh, then was found and made readable. Um, and that's pretty much it. <laughs> uh, there's a little bit there that's this. You know, there, there's a, the Verge included a quote from Bobby Kotick when he was on the stand talking about like, hey, you, uh, you guys, uh, would you guys support this, the next Switch? You didn't really support the existing one. And it's him going like, yeah, we kind of blew it. Probably should have done that. We probably could have made some money. Uh, putting Call of Duty out on the, the Switch probably would have been good business. Probably would have been smart. I don't know. Um, so, yeah, it's another example of a, and this one is like a on the record entered into court type thing of uh, developers getting briefed on Nintendo's next hardware. So all of this kind of further supports that idea that maybe we do end up seeing a new Switch uh, next holiday season. Um, which, you know, if you look at Mortal Kombat Run 1 running on the Switch. Yeah. Yeah. You can see why some third parties might want to see some upgrades. Uh, but also further supporting the notion that the specs appear to be in line with PS4 and Xbox One um, capabilities. So we'll see. Uh, and uh, yeah, also in the news. <sighs> games are coming to the iPhone. Have you heard of this? They're going to make video games that run on your phone. Uh, Apple announced the new iPhone 15 last week. And as part of that event, they showed Resident Evil Village, Assassin's Creed Mirage, uh, Death Stranding will also be coming to, and these will, so these are games that are, I guess, going to run on the iPhone 15 Pro because uh, the uh, they're you know looking to assure a certain level of performance. And so these are the more expensive versions of the iPhone 15. There's the Pro and the Pro Max. It's a size difference, mostly. Um, and uh, there's an IGN story. They got hands, uh, they got an offhand demo, which I, I assume that means hands-off demo. <laughs> uh, anyway... Resident Evil Village ran natively on the iPhone 15 Pro at 30 frames per second. So, um, so yeah, RE4 Remake, Resident Evil Village, and Death Stranding are due out later this year. Assassin's Creed Mirage is due out the first half of next year. I, we've been on the merry-go-round of games coming to phones, and real games are going to run on your phone. And oh my gosh, uh, so many times now that I don't know that I can care. It seems like once, once per press conference... Apple trots somebody out uh, from the world of video games and they go, this is great. All the way back to John Carmack on like Q3 test runs great on these fucking Mac towers. Have you seen these things? Man. Uh, all the way up to, you know, whatever we're doing now, Death Stranding, I guess. Um, 
the the Mac OS, like, you know, the, the I guess Mac hardware has evolved to a point where they've got a really interesting set of tools for game developers uh, that are looking to port games uh, that, that kind of meet them halfway on that stuff. And that's an interesting concept. How well this stuff ends up doing on phones, I you know, I don't know. The the thing, kind of the 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 thing to remember, and and this is a conversation that we don't have enough when we think about um, the idea of people playing console style games on their phones through X Cloud or whatever service, you know, just whatever way they're doing it. Is there's this sort of problem you have of like. People use their phones for shorter sessions than people use consoles. And so you have to build these games in such a way where it's like they have to be reliably paused and stopped and shorter session lengths have to be considered and um, and all of those things. And uh, as well as, of course, battery life. And so you, you end up in these situations where uh, you have to ask, like, could Resident Evil run at 60 frames per second on an iPhone 15 Pro? Maybe. But that might also make the phone hot and it might make the battery life drain out extremely quickly. And so, you know, you have cases where games have capped their frame rates for thermal reasons, for, you know, for a variety of of reasons. I think they did. I, I didn't go back and watch the Apple press conference in full, but I think they brought out the there's that mobile division game that Ubisoft is working on. Um, I played that back in June and it was a pretty good, you know, it was like, hey, look, it's the Division. It's like Division 1 era Division, new missions kind of set in that environment and that quality of environment. And and you look at it and go, yeah, huh, this is recognizable as the Division. And uh, I'm not sure that I want to do this on a phone. Uh, the, the session length, especially in a multiplayer session, I'm mean, just envisioning scenarios where you're playing a game multiplayer and then you get a phone call. Or something, or, or, or you're on a bus and you got to get off the bus, or this or that, you know. Mobile gaming sessions are so interruptible that the idea of online multiplayer games, or, or co op multiplayer games in this case, where it's like, oh, we're three players, and oh, we're taking down this guy with a flamethrower, and then fucking my homie got a phone call and dropped out the game. Oh, shit. We have to do this whole mission again because we failed. You know, it's it's a design problem. You have to design the game with that sort of stuff in mind, and maybe they are, and maybe they've got easily recoverable this and that to to make that not a big deal. But um, it's just something that doesn't really come up all that often when we talk about games running on phones, and I think games running on the Switch to a certain extent as well. But I think that depends on your age and your circumstance, uh, how long your your sessions on the Switch really are. Um. I, I, I was due for a phone upgrade. Uh, you know, Hey, we're, we're having a new kid and I want to take the best photos possible. So, uh, so why not get a new phone? Um, it's a write-off because it plays resident evil. You understand. Wink, wink. Um, And so that should be here Friday, I guess. I don't know. I had to order from AT&T because I, they took pre-orders at 5 a.m. And I was awake at 5 a.m. And I even set an alert on my phone. But my phone did not alert me to go buy the new phone. And so I uh, didn't. And by the time I went to look at Apple's site, they were all sold out for launch day. And then I, anyway. I'll have more to say about the phone in the future. I don't, I don't you know, but like, I don't, it's not launching with any of these games. So it's not like it's going to be like, the launch of the iPhone 15. It's such a gaming powerhouse. Like, who cares? We'll see. We'll see. Um, gosh, a lot of fucking news. We haven't even talked about any of the goddamn games that came out this week. Have you heard? It? Have you heard of Titanfall Two? We'll talk about it in a little bit here. Uh, there was a Nintendo Direct. Where they announced such things as an HD version of Paper Mario, The Thousand Year Door. Also, a new Mario vs. Donkey Kong, which looks S-I-C-K sick. Oh, it looks good. Um, show some more Super Mario RPG. 
Uh, Princess Peach Showtime is the official name of the Peach game. My daughter and I watched that trailer about three times, but then she, we were, I had my, she's learning how to work a mouse and she's learning how to watch things on YouTube. And it's gonna, there's a matter of time here. She's going to have a lot of ideas about men's roles in society. Uh, and, and she, she's going to figure out how to buy things. And then there's just going to be a bunch of weird nutraceuticals showing up in the mail. And just, I don't know. It's, it's a scary yeah, I got to get her into Skibbity Toilet. That's a safe, that's a much safer avenue than unfettered YouTube. Um, Luigi's Mansion 2 is coming out in HD next summer. Sure, why not? Um, the Peach game looks good. I thought that that would be the trailer my daughter wanted to watch a billion times, but she, instead she watched it like twice and then found the Mario versus Donkey Kong trailer and found herself watching that over and over again. And then she found the Mario Kart DLC trailer for Wave 6 and watched that a zillion times as well. So um, so she she already forgot about the Princess Peach game. But uh, she was very into it. Um, and then I downloaded F-099 and then she played a bunch of F-099 and crashed into the walls a bunch during the tutorials. Um... And then at two in the morning the other night, I was awake because my son woke up and I was like, oh, right, F-099, I got to play some of that. So I played some F-099. Um, it's really neat. You know, it is a SNES F-0 looking game, but they have crammed 99 players onto the track and uh, created kind of a battle royale mentality around it. That, that is uh, an interesting idea. I think NST did it. Um... And it's, uh, it's cool. I don't know. I, I, uh, I need to spend some more time with it, but, uh, you know, it's one of those like, Hey, here's a, here's a thing that is no additional charge. If you are one of the members of our online thing, it's cool. Um, I, the highest I finished is 15th, which seemed pretty good, but I, I just, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I just need to be better at F zero. I thought I was all right at F zero, but I guess it's been a long time. I also would have thought, you know, if you were going to cram a lot of cars onto an F0 track, that F0X would have been the game. But, uh, those, as far as I'm concerned, the two F0 games are F0 and F0X. The GBA games are okay, but they're not, you know, they're not. And GX, like, I just, I don't care at that point. It's just like, whatever, like, it's fine. It's an, at, at that point, it's just like, here's another arcade racer. Uh, it's good, but eh. Um, a new Contra game was shown. Way Forward is working on it. I really did not like the look of it one bit. Uh, like, it feels like it is sort of um, trying to be more of a throwback to classic Contra which is uh, the, probably the right move. There's been a lot of... If you go back and look, whether it was mobile or some other stuff, there's been some really crummy Contra games, uh, especially over the years. But this new one, Operation Galuga, uh, I think it looks so bad. I think the visuals are just so terrible. <laughs> um, and Contra has been on such a bad run. Uh, it's hard to get excited for this. You just look at it and go, uh, Um... But hey, hopefully, you know, way forward has, has definitely done some some good stuff in the past. So so hopefully we'll we'll get there. Some other stuff, you know, trombone champs coming to switch. That's cool. Um and uh and yeah. Sony also on the same day had a um a state of play. Uh not a ton. Uh the the date for the next Final Fantasy VII remake um installment was announced it's February 29th and kind of other coverage there. They confirmed that you will not import your save from the previous game. So it's not like one long adventure with your leveled up characters. You will kind of start over as a, as a standalone sort of thing. Um, you'll unlock some shit if you have save data, but it's not, you're not just straight up importing your characters. I'm, I, I don't, I don't think that should come as a huge surprise, honestly, but uh, you know, um, 
Helldivers 2 got pushed to next year. Honkai Star Rail got a release date, October 11th. But the most important um, announcement, as far as I am concerned, Foam Stars Open Beta. That's right. The Foam Stars Open Beta Party will begin on September 29th. And it will be that weekend. I guess I assume that's a weekend, right? Yeah. Next Friday, the Foam Stars Open Beta Party begins. It'll have two modes in it. One of the modes is one of the modes I played back in June. Another one is another mode. I don't know. Um I am very uh excited to see the reaction to Foam Stars when more people get their hands on it. I enjoyed my time with foam stars i think they are kind of on to something in terms of making a splatoon-esque shooter that is not exclusive to the switch i don't necessarily this is not me saying it's as good as splatoon but it is me saying it is a little different it is more hero shooter it is more you pick a character and you've got you know an ult and whatever else um i kind of like the look of it a little bit i don't know it, it's there's something about it that is kind of interesting. I, and again, I'll be curious to see when people get their hands on it. I think if you were just directly comparing it to Splatoon, uh, you will look at it and go, man, fuck this. But I think on its own merits, it kind of seems okay. I'm curious also to see if it is, it says play on PS five, but I think it is. I think it is also coming to PS four. I don't know that for sure off the top of my head, but um, anyway, that beta starts next weekend. Um, if that game is free to play, it will be all right. If they charge a lot of money for that, if that, if that game comes out and is $60, no one will care. Um, but, but I'm curious, I'm curious to see as more people get their hands on it, uh, what the, what the overall reaction is. Um, let's see, uh, the Immortals of Avium uh, developer, Ascended Studios, has laid off uh, a little under half their staff, um, according to uh, Brett Robbins, who's the CEO of Ascended Studios. That happened on Thursday. Uh, this is also just um, multiple people in the studio confirming that to Polygon and other, and other outlets. Um. Brett Robbins, who's the CEO, then posted to Twitter as, as word started to get out and said, Today we are heartbroken as we part ways with friends and colleagues at Ascended Studios, about 45% of our team. This was a painfully difficult but necessary decision that was not made lightly. Nevertheless, we have to make this adjustment now that Immortals of Avium has shipped. We are supporting those affected in every way we can, including comprehensive severance and job placement assistance, as well as support services for those who remain. If your studio is looking for proven UE5 artists and engineers, please reach out and let us know so we can introduce you to some incredibly talented game devs. Um, there's, there's more to it, but that's the, that's the gist. Um, it sounds like the internal message was that Immortals of Avium did not sell and that this is the adjustment that they had to make as a result of that game not selling. Um, This is unfortunate, but also, uh, you know, this is the part where like, hey, it, it's unfortunate that there is a real human cost to this stuff. But also as someone who played a chunk of Immortals of Avium, I don't think it's a particularly good game. Um, and so, you know, you could make arguments about like, well, it wasn't marketed this and that and it launched at a bad time and this. And I suppose, um, you know, you could try to second guess or, you know, armchair quarterback your way through it is about what they could have done better. But at the end of the day, I just don't think that game was, uh, was especially great. Um, you know, and, and yeah, coming out of this time of year, yeah, there's a lot of arguments you can make about when it shipped and, and whatever else, but like it just, I, uh, that game is lacking a certain spark. It is a, a relatively mid tier game. Um, it's okay in spots ran weird, you know, the going all in on, on real engine five kind of has its, uh, downsides, I suppose, in terms of system requirements and people, you know, being unhappy, unhappy with how it ran. 
on on kind of every platform um though they did put in work to clean up the frame rate and stuff on console um yeah, so I, I I don't know, you know, this is this happened. Of course, there was the closure of Volition. There was a story going around. I don't have it in front of me, but I guess uh, in you know around the closure of Volition, you know, some studios kind of went out to. I guess they're in Champagne, right? They they went out there uh, to have kind of meetings. I think Microsoft and and maybe another uh, publisher went out there and, and said, "Hey, if you're these are the, the like kind of having a job fair." uh at, at volitions uh in in volitions city trying to look for people that um that might be looking for work um so i don't know this is uh you know again like you can talk about the results the end results of immortals of avium but you know um mr robbins is right that you know hey you know more and more people are probably going to need some ue5 like hey they they shipped a game on unreal engine 5 that probably makes them um, at least somewhat desirable on its own, assuming they're good uh, in, in other ways. So, I, uh, yeah, I, I would expect that, that some of these folks at least will, will be able to uh, get on somewhere else. But, man, it's, it's frustrating. And soon also, like very soon after launch, to be like, all right, writing's on the wall on this one. This is what we got to do if there if we want there to be any studio left. It's tough. Um, Grand Theft Auto Five turned ten over the weekend. Ten, ten years of Grand Theft Auto Five. A decade of GTA Five. Real wild. The idea that I, I still remember going to the hotel in San Francisco to pick up a copy of GTA five for the Xbox 360 from uh, a rock star representative, like meeting them in the lobby and basically just having envelopes slid across the table. No one distributes games like Rockstar, And I don't know why they do that. And they still, they, they still did it. Then red dead, actually, I think they just sent to us. Um, but there was something real, like, here you go, man. Um, I have met people on street corners to pick up <laughs> copies of GTA pre-release San Andreas. I had, I met someone uh, San Andreas. I needed a second copy of it because the first one broke in a freak accident. So someone fucking basically flew across country with a copy in a briefcase and met me on a corner so that I can continue reviewing the game. Uh, how was Sneak King distributed, asks chat. Uh, we went to a drive-up window and said, hey, let us buy those games off you without, you know, we, let's just buy these games off you. Let's just get all three. In fact, we want, we, we want, we want two of each. Pretty easy, all told. Um... 10 years of GTA five is wild, man. And they put out a thing on, I think it was on Instagram or wherever that was just like to everyone who's ever role played to everyone who's ever did this, like all like the idea that they're like celebrating role playing now when it was something that they were, you know, trying to sue to stop modders not that long ago is, is a little funny, but, um, <clears throat> uh, but the success story of GTA five is, insane it has gone on to become one of the best selling video games of all time um all of it based on almost all of it based on a part of the game that i never thought was very much fun <laughs> you know the the story in gta 5 i thought was really cool and then remember when gta online came out and it was completely fucking broken Boy, oh boy, it was busted. It was so busted. And every time I go back to it, I'm like, I, there's still, I, you know, I guess if I had friends who just want to fucking hang out and pretend to be criminals, that maybe this would be fun. But I, I, this is not really, this, I don't, who is this for? Not for me. For someone. Um... And it's crazy to think about how big that game has become and um, what it has done to Rockstar. I mean, you know, like it, it's easy to, when you think about 10 years of that game and the success story of GTA Online 
and what that is likely to do to the games that Rockstar makes from here on out, you start to understand why some of the old guard left. I say that without really knowing the full story about GTA 6, right? Because of the game's not out and all that other stuff. But it's easy to look at it and go like, well, they've got to make a game that replaces GTA Online or it builds on it or whatever they end up doing. But if you were the sort of person who, you know, was there for all of the other big GTA games and writing these stories and sitting down and laughing and like, hey, we're in this writer's room coming up with dumb radio dialogue and then we got to do this and... uh. And we got to name this restaurant and a burger shot. That is, that's perfect. Write that down. You know, like, like those days of GTA of, of saying like, let's make something that's like Goodfellas this time. Yeah. Okay. Oh, let's do some Miami Coke movie type stuff. Cool. Great. Let's do some West coast shit. Like, yes, let's, 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 um, to being at a point to where it's like, okay, I don't know. Let's do this story. And then also, um, we need to write a billion kind of minor stories that can go for the next 10 years of this game. Um, I could see why you would be like, I'm, I've made a lot of money doing this and it's time for me to go. <laughs> um, we'll see. I don't know. It's, uh, it's, it's, I, I'm, you know, obviously some GTA six stuff did leak out. And, you know, you kind of see some bits and pieces of what that story might be and what that game might be like and, and all of that. But the, the bar they have to reach for it to be a success story now is fucking nuts. Like, look at what they have to compete against all of a sudden. It's not just, let's make another GTA. It's... Oh yeah, uh, we need to make another GTA Online. From a technical standpoint, you could see a lot of ways how you could make a better GTA Online. Obviously, uh, newer platforms, better graphics, more this, more that. Um, but Jesus Christ, to try to have to sit there and come up with storylines and DLC and this and you know, like, okay, now let's. All right, we got Dr. Dre for this one. All right, let's write it. At some point, I, I it just, you know, it's such a different challenge than the one that everyone signed up for when they first started writing these games that I could see getting to a point where you're like, I don't need to do this anymore. And I'm going to go do something, anything else, whether that's Leslie Benzies or... um. Dan Hauser, one of the Hauser brothers. It's just like, I'm going to go. Um, it's wild. But yeah, I, I don't know. It's uh, that, that seems like a very daunting task. The idea, like when you think about what GTA five turned into the success story that it became, um, the idea of having to follow that up. Yeah, again, you could see why Dan Hauser, why Laszlo, like some of the people doing the writing and maybe you get to a point with the writing because that's the thing that I always think about is like, how do you write one of these games in this day and age, especially, you know, with uh, how absurd actual culture is now, uh, the idea of writing something that lampoons it seems increasingly impossible. Um, so, you know, the, the kind of classic GTA humor, I don't think works anymore. You could argue that it has not worked for a good long time, but you know, they haven't put out one in a good long time. So they haven't necessarily had to, uh, to do that stuff. Um, yeah, it's, it's weird. It's, it's a, it's a weird turn of events. Anyway, I, I wish everyone at rockstar the best when it comes to figuring out what the fuck that, whatever they've already figured it out by now. They just have to finish making it, I suppose. Um, that's it for the news. We should talk about some video games that I played. Uh, if you, if you, hey, have you heard of Titanfall 2? Uh, it's a video game. Uh, you can run it on your PC. You can run it on a PlayStation 5. You can run it on an Xbox Series X. 
Uh, it is like uh, it is like three dollars on Steam. It's a first person shooter that is kind of like Call of Duty, um, but also it has these sick fucking robots in it, and you get to get in the robots and pilot them around. Uh, and also you can run on the walls and it is the most free form, cool feeling movement you've ever seen in a video game ever in the history of ever. Well, that game works again after years of being inundated with, I guess, hackers that were just basically bombarding the servers, um, in ways that made the game unplayable. You would connect to a game, it would freeze up and you would be knocked offline um, it has been broken for a long time. It is no longer broken. They have apparently updated the game. They have also even the, the playlists and some of the things that they were updating for a long time, like they have started updating the playlists again. And so you can just buy Titanfall two on like the, you can buy the console versions or maybe you already own it and re you can reinstall it and you can play Titanfall two on the internet again. I did it on a PlayStation 5 and on PC. It both worked. Of course, there were um, there was a custom server mod that came out for the PC version called North Star that was uh, awesome. Um, my problem with playing the PC version of Titanfall is that a lot of people are playing on um, a mouse and keyboard and they seem very dominant over controller players. Um... I played it on my Steam Deck, though, and it ran real well there. And that's pretty awesome. It, it's, it's, if, 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 this Titanfall 2 is, uh, is a hell of a game. And it's got a great campaign that if you have not played, you should play. It is maybe the last great shooter campaign I certainly don't think I can think of a campaign in a shooter that is better than Titanfall 2's that came after. Um, and it's like three bucks on Steam. And it works online, and there are people playing it online. So, uh, you should give it a shot. You should reinstall it. You should do something with it. Because it works again. And for a while, it wasn't working. Um... So I, I played, a, I played a bunch of that. <laughs> like I, uh, I, I, uh, prestiged like twice on the PlayStation. So that's why I wanted to play there more than on PC. Um, and, um, it's an amazing video game. There was also something, I guess that kind of, it was in the, some of the apex legends patch notes where they posted some numbers that corresponded to the release dates of Titanfall 1, Titanfall 2, and Apex Legends in a way that is giving people hope for the future. I don't, I don't want to be hurt again. I don't want to be hurt again. But what if they made another Titanfall? There was just some quotes pretty recently out of, uh, I think it was out of the EA earnings call that they were basically just like, man, fucking respawn, huh? Those guys are on some shit and they're making more shit. And they're, it's, and, you know, so they, uh, obviously they've got the Star Wars shooter. Star Wars Jedi Survivor came out and I, that, that game still doesn't run well on PC. That's frustrating. Um, it's frustrating. I'm not going to just give the studio a blanket pass on that stuff because that stuff doesn't work well. Um, but I'm but I'm very interested to see what a Star Wars first person shooter is out of them in terms of they can make a fucking hell of a first person shooter. And there's been some really good, I'm, you know, I'm not a Star Wars guy, but I am a Dark Forces guy. So I'll happily take a look at a Star Wars first person shooter. Um, and they have other stuff, you know, they still have their like Skunk Works teams out there figuring shit out and, and figuring out what's next and, and whatever else. So I, I don't know what that means for the future of them and 
they could use uh, honestly in a situation where um where battlefield is still in a uh in a state i suppose oh well they probably fixed the game but you know like like battlefield has uh you know taken some knocks they could use a good win that is outside of the battlefield franchise because the battlefield franchise has so much baggage with it good and bad so what if what if they made Titanfall 3 and it was an amazing video game and people felt good about shooters from EA again and then they could get put out a battlefield and you know people would maybe be a little more open to it I'm not a strategy guy I'm not a biz dev fucking guy but I think if you just pump out another big battlefield game and go this one's good it's not going to get them there. You need a palate cleanser. You need something. Uh, as much as I'm hesitant to fucking lump a new Titanfall game or something like that into the role of a palate cleanser for the Battlefield franchise because being secondary to Battlefield is what got us here in the goddamn first place. That said, I would accept a new Titanfall under any circumstances. In all likelihood, is this just a, a season? Are they teasing? Are they teasing new Apex stuff? Perhaps. Who the hell knows? Um. Maybe they're teasing nothing. I don't know. Maybe maybe this is just they wanted to point out that like, hey, we fixed Titanfall. Sorry. Um. Or maybe they had to fix Titanfall because if they announced new Titanfall stuff while the Titanfall stuff was still broken, it would make them seem bad. I don't know. Anyway, feels good to be out there uh, repping all uh, Vincent Dynamics once again. So Titanfall 2, give it a look. Other video games. There's a new Mortal Kombat out this week. Crazy, right? I guess it technically came out last week if you, uh, if you spent the expensive amount of money for it. Um, I guess we have not really talked about Mortal Kombat 1 here on this podcast. Um... Mortal Kombat 1 is good. I like it. I am close to getting all the trophies in it. Um, I think it's a really fun story. There's some stuff that happens late in that story that is, I think, absolutely incredible. Uh, it is sort of fan service but it is, I think, some of the best stuff they have ever done. It is some of the most exciting and weird stuff that they have ever done. Uh, and it's mind blowing and they could build a whole game around it. And I think that would be cool. Uh, it'd be hard to balance, but they should, it'd be cool. Um, if you thought create a fatality was weird, uh, it has, a, you know, th there's in terms of alternative modes, it's sort of a, like on paper, you look at it and think like, oh, well, wait, it doesn't have a crypt because it does not have a crypt. Um, but what it does have is invasions mode, which is sort of the live tower type stuff that they have done in the past. And there are chests there you can open. You'll be unlocking and earning gear as you go. You'll also unlock a bunch of seasonal currency, which you can use to, uh, purchase your own cosmetics. This season is scorpion themed. And so they went and made scorpion style, scorpion colored outfits for the entire roster. Should you want them? It's actually kind of fucking awesome. Um, and you cannot, you know, that's, that currency is not something you can currently buy for actual dollars. Maybe that will change, but, but currently that's, uh, a, a separate, uh, earnable pipeline, uh, where I've been able to buy, you know, I've, I've put some hours into it. I've not finished the in invasion mode or whatever for this season, but I've got a whole hell of a lot of, of seasonal currency because it's like the daily and weekly quests give you more of that currency and you're unlocking more of the stuff. And, and, and so I've had quite a lot of it. Um, and it's, uh, some of it's pretty neat. You know, you want to tat it up Liu Kang with fucking shitty looking fire tattoos and fire pants. If you want people wearing pants what got flames on them like they just walked out the hot topic this season of mortal Kombat one has you fucking covered um <laughs> it's very good um 
the invasions mode is like the live tower stuff in that the fights have modifiers. And so you'll go in and be like, oh, the screen goes dark every five seconds or, oh, I, my controls are reversed. And that stuff's like, uh, I've been enjoying going through the invasions mode. It has not been especially difficult, but it, you know, it, it is very similar to a lot of the, um, the live tower mode stuff they've done in the past, all the way back to MK nine, I think had some of that stuff. Um, and then, then they expanded on it in the Vita version, if I remember correctly. Um, so that that's kind of the the secondary mode if you're going to play a single player thing, and uh, and I think that's been pretty engaging. Um, the story mode's good. I, I I like the story a lot. I think it, it's uh, it's fun um, in terms of how it retells the origin stories of a lot of these characters and kind of resets the universe. It is also extremely. Um, a sequel to Mortal Kombat 11 for as much as they called it Mortal Kombat one. And for as much as it is resetting the origin stories of some of these characters, it is a direct sequel to Mortal Kombat 11. Like it's, it's, it's both, you know? Um, and, uh, I think that stuff's good. I think it is maybe the best Quan Chi that they have ever done. What? Okay. No, it is the best Quan Chi dating back to Mortal Kombat mythologies. To the cutscenes in MK Mythology Sub Zero, that which is the best Quan Chi that they have ever done, um, and so yeah, they 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 did right by Quan Chi. That Shang Tsung is such an interesting, yeah, just like the characters themselves in terms of how they fight and play. There's there's fun changes and fun interesting things there, um, to the way the moves are distributed and who has what, and you know, there's just um. You know, Johnny Cage doesn't really have a fireball anymore. Like it's a, it's an interesting, it's an interesting version of Johnny Cage that is really fucking crazy. And in the story mode, because you're playing as these characters in some cases before they have powers, you're encountering like here's Raiden that doesn't have any control of lightning whatsoever. He's just got a cool kick. <laughs> and then the one in the regular arcade mode, and the one you see later in the story. By that point, he has become you know, a more powerful Raiden and stuff. So there's kind of interesting, you know, stuff throughout that story when it comes to, you know, the changing up the characters and, and, and all of that. I've been playing a lot of Scorpion, which I, I, every one of these, I, I've said it before, but every, every Mortal Kombat, I go in going like, who am I going to play as and, and trying out a lot of the roster. Um, but I, I've been having a lot of fun with Scorpion. He's been really interesting in terms of just like air combos and I'm figuring out fun stuff to do in the air uh, with him, there's a lot of, uh, um, you know, air combos and stuff like that is, is the kind of new thing in the game. Um, and the cameo characters, which are secondary characters that you pick for assists, I'm starting to get the hang of that a little bit. The tutorial actually is very good for that because I, you think about the cameo characters just like, well, I'm going to call out Scorpion. He's going to shoot a spear. I'm going to call out Sub-Zero. He's going to freeze somebody which that stuff is in there. Like Cyrax will come out and shoot a net at somebody, but the proper way to use a lot of the cameos isn't just you standing there and you push the button because a lot of times when you do that, your main character just stands there and poses while the other thing happens. It's not like you're moving and then they come in and do a thing to make that happen. You have to cancel into the cameo attack. So, for example, Cyrax has a, a spinning, like an arms out spin punch that he does that goes up into the air. And if you just hit the button, he'll walk out and do it, but you're probably not at the right range for it to hit or anything like that. And so it's this situation where, like, with Scorpion, for example, I can pop him up in the air with a launcher. As I'm getting ready to do the launcher, hit that cameo button, cancel into that so Cyrax comes out does the arm thing juggles them in the air and serves them up for me to then do more after the, that attack is finished. And that is how the cameo characters seem to be best used. And so that's why I think, you know, I spent a lot of hours going like, I, these guys, why I'm hitting this button and why I'm it's, it's not fluid. It doesn't flow. I feel like, you know, my character literally cannot move. While fucking striker walks out here and hits somebody with a stick. It's fucking weird. Um, 
But as I spend more time with it, and again, the, the tutorial that they have in there literally talks all about canceling into cameo attacks. And, and as soon as I went through that, I, it, like, it all kind of clicked for me. And I was like, okay, okay, yeah, this is the, this is what I've been missing. Like, this is the thing I have not been doing. And, and now that I'm starting to work that in, uh, I'm like, okay, yeah, I see, I see how you would, you would do this sort of stuff. Um, it's, uh, it, it's shipped in a weird state. This is a case we, we talk about this a lot and a lot of games don't always, um, subject the early players to this, but Mortal Kombat one is a game that needs another patch or two. It's, uh, it's already got some, but you know, there were cases in the story mode where like, you know, the music just cuts like it, you're finishing a fight and it's going into a cutscene, and it's a smooth transition, but the music just boom stops, uh, when it makes that transition, there's, there's weird stuff like that. Um, sometimes you're, you know, I, I've had situations where it's like, it's, it's hitting the server for everything. So like when you're, when you're spending currency to unlock a random unlockable thing, out of their little slot machine thing uh, that hits a server and it takes too long. And sometimes it feels like your inventory takes, it doesn't save right. Or, you know, like the server connection drops and this is like, there's just some weirdness around that. They did one patch that made that aspect of the game a lot better, but um, there are still situations where the move list is wrong. Um, like Goro's fatality. Goro is a cameo character, but the cameo characters do have their own fatalities. I believe in the move list, it says back forward down cameo button from up close, but it's really more like half screen to full screen. Um, and so the range just seems wrong. Like there's just little bits and pieces of just like, oh, this move that I'm trying to do isn't coming out. And you're like, oh, okay, that, that's because they... Like their notation is weird. They, they should have said something, you know, or their definition of close is different than mine or whatever it is. Like even because they have like close, mid, full screen, but mid is full screen, just not full, full screen because the camera, you know, the zooms in and out a little bit. Uh, and so some of that stuff is funky. Um, just some funky situations like that where it clearly just needs another patch or two to uh, either fix them. I've heard some people say that a lot of the frame data is just straight up wrong too, but I, I haven't verified that for myself. Um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, so it's like ever so slightly rough around the edges in those ways that you just go like, yeah, you know, and that's expected for shipping games these days up to a point, I suppose but when you have these situations where someone maybe spent a hundred or like 150, you know, if you bought your Liu Kang statue or whatever, uh, if you spent that amount of money on the game and your reward is you get to play the extra funky, janky version of it, um, not a great bonus, you know, not an amazing bonus. Like, hey, you get early access before our day one patches are out. I that's that's not good. It's not good. Um, and this game should have been in slightly better shape. You know, none of these are like huge. Again, I I had a really good time with it. You know, it's none of this stuff is like pure deal breaker. But you can see that from here. When you see this, these situations where it's like, hey, you paid a whole lot of money in order to play this game five days early, and the version you're getting is messy in ways that it shouldn't be, especially to you, our best customers, uh, our best day one customers who are spending the most money. Like, it, it's that's not cool. They should... Um, I don't know. Uh, you know, like, does it, is it, is it bad enough that it needs a make good? I don't know. Potentially, you know, is there a situation where it's like, Hey, yeah, you should probably give these people enough money for a paid skin or, you know, Hey, give them 800 fucking dragon dollars, bison bucks, you know, whatever the Shao Kahn, Shing, whatever. Um, dragon money. 
<laughs> Give them the dragon money. Um, but I, yeah, I, I, but the game is not like mad broken, so I don't think they will do that. It, it wasn't like un, literally unplayable. But it's just a situation where you just go like, this is this is one of those things that like you know when you blow it out over the next five years, increasingly sets that bad precedent to where this isn't the game that does it. But we'll eventually, and I'm sure that someone can point out an early access that was completely fucking hosed already. I'm sure it's happened already. It's just, I can't, I can't think of it off the top of my head. Um, I know some MMOs have had their like head starts be fucking disasters. Um, and they've had to do make goods and, and, and whatever else. But like this situation of these kind of very normal console games that are not big MMOs that don't do the head start thing and whatever, still doing the, um, pay us and you can play it early thing if your game is in not in in shipping shape or it's in you know just barely shipping shape it just doesn't leave a good taste in people's mouths you know and again this is not the case that breaks it but these are the cases that help someone break it later you know uh so th that stuff's a little frustrating just you know more conceptually than in practice i suppose but um academically if you will uh but yeah I, i've i've uh, been having a really really good time with it and i'm figuring out cool shit to do and i can't always do it reliably because some of the timing on the juggles gets very specific and when you launch them and oh you did it into a corner so it's like i'm having to come up with variants about like well if i'm knocking them into the corner actually the best thing for me to do is this version of the combo because then I can land and uppercut them out of the corner or blah, 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 or keep them in the corner if I so desire. Um, but like I'm bad at that game in a lot of very noticeable ways. Like I just don't fight well up close. Um, I don't know what to do to get away from just pokes and just real, real simple shit. Uh, and when to stick my foot in the middle of a combo. That's actually the thing is like, you know, you'll see Johnny Cage coming at you with 9,000 fucking hits in a row and you're just there going like, when do, okay, can I, can I fit my foot? My, I need to hit, get my knee in here so I can launch into my combo. When is it my turn? Is this part my turn? Is this part my turn? Because right now I'm playing as people that are just doing the whole combo, even if it doesn't land, uh, they're not stopping and changing it up. They're not changed and they're not, they're not, uh, hit confirming, I suppose. If we want to try to use the lingo. Um, <clears throat> but I, I think it's a really, it, it's really fun. It's really fun. Um, and uh, the story is a blast. Like there's some of the best stuff they've ever done in a story, I think is, is in there. Uh, and I, yeah, I, I, I saw someone do a combo that was, you know, there was some video of a combo out there that was doing like 90% damage already. You're just looking at it and go like, gross, that's fucking awesome, but it's disgusting. Um, and, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, so yeah, I, you know, whatever I, I think it's, it's a weird recommendation. Like, Hey, you should check out mortal Kombat. Uh, you know that already. I think if you are, uh, into it you probably already know that so but i but i will say as someone who has spent about 30 hours with it now uh it's cool i like it a lot it's a good one of those also there is a part of me that it, and have you know this has been kind of a long time coming here as they put out more and more games i think they um, I, I would like to see a more dramatic change next time out. I don't know what that change should be, but as much as I like the way these games play, I think that there's just some aspect of the way their combos are structured, the way that they, the way the game relies on combo breakers. I would almost rather like, what if the game had shorter, more damage? And again, this is, you know, we're talking about a different game at this point, but like, you know, what if, what if a game had shorter, more damaging combos and you didn't need breakers? Um, or, or just, I, I don't know, combo breakers to me in, in a weird way, just feel, they feel like the kind of easy way out on, um, having to like when you see these combos online that are you know doing massive damage and they go for a very long time of you just like watching it happening i'm like well 
I, I don't might it's not my turn to get my foot in here. So I have to sit here and watch this stuff. Oh, wait, my meter filled up. I can use the breaker, burn my entire meter and then get out of the combo. Like it feels like a panic button, not only on the player's part, but sometimes it feels like a panic button on the developer's part. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I just, I, I kind of wish that the combos were just different. And I think that they could be along with a much larger change to the game. This isn't me saying Mortal Kombat one should have shorter combos. Like that's that game. That's the game they made. All those systems work in concert and they make sense. But I, when I think about the future of Mortal Kombat, I think I would like to see something a little more is attainable. The word is attainable. The word I, I, I Mortal Kombat three ultimate Mortal Kombat three got fucking crazy when you got into seeing people that could literally just like the game felt broken watching high end players play as Ermac and some of the stuff they could do and corner combos and just some of the weird stuff that people could do back then. So I'm not saying that that game is perfect by any means about what I'm talking about here. Um, But I think the level of standard combos in MK3, what you can get away with, how much damage it does, 20, 30%, and how long it takes. Uh, there's something about the length of how long everything in Mortal Kombat takes now, right? It's not just like you'll have these combos that are just like f huge long strings and you're there blocking and, you know, blocking is challenging because someone's going to get an overhead in here. So you got to stand up, you got to crouch, you got to stand up and do this. You're like, oh, this air part come. And then you got to counter with your thing once you see the window to counter in and, and, and all of, all of that stuff. And then you've got the fatalities, which are fun, but they, they're long. The cameo fatalities are better because they're decisive and, and off, brutalities are the best for this. But there's a shortness. There's a fucking like, check it out. That fucker's dead. Anyway, let's move on. That the core fatalities get into like, all right, this guy's dead. And now we're dragging his body apart with the spikes and doing this. And then this dragon is showing up and doing that. And like, I that stuff looks cool. I enjoy it. I think it's funny. But also, I don't want this game to be the Final Fantasy VII of fighting games. I don't want a fucking summon animation at the end of every fight. You know what I mean? And so I think there's something about the length of combos, the length of the fatalities. There's just certain aspects of the game that kind of bog it down just a little bit. Um, and take the control out of your hands for just a little bit too long. And I'm sure like, you know, high end players would say like, well, you need to manage your meters and do this and do the combo breaker here. And you, you need to know that this is the spot where you can do this. And, and high level players won't just unload their full combo string on someone who's blocking. They'll mix it up and try to, you know, but the level of play that I suspect most players will end up at, which is at the level I'm at some better, some worse. Um, I think that I, I just, I don't know. There's something about the game that I wish just happened. I, I wish I got to decision points more quickly in some of these fights. Um, and maybe there are decision points that I'm missing because I'm blocking when it's like, oh, this actually was my opportunity to stick my foot in there. I just don't know the frame data well enough to do this. And I'm probably never going to know the, the frame data well enough to do this. Um, but the game incentivizes you doing finishing moves because you earn XP for it. And because I'm trying to get all the trophies and because I want to get all the unlocks, like you're unlocking cool skins for your cameos. I unlocked the red player two fucking shirt for striker last night. And I was like, yeah, fucking now we're in goddamn business. I unlocked strikers first brutality which is the in a game full of the craziest murder sequences you've ever seen in a video game. This striker brutality 
where he walks out. It's, it comes out of your throw, which you do throws with your cameo characters. And so you're throwing and Stryker comes out and shocks him with a taser. And if you end the fight with it, he will just pull out a pistol and fucking shoot the guy in the head. And then he gets covered in blood. Just blah. And it is like the most, it is actually probably the most gruesome thing in the entire game. <laughs> in a game that is shredding bodies and, you know, slicing and dicing and, and all this stuff. Dude with pistol goes, fuck this, pop. Is crazy. And you know why it's crazy? And I don't know of any other moves in the game that do this. There probably are. It's probably something they do on multiple brutalities or something. A lot of the characters that you're doing the moves to have a fucking line of dialogue as they're getting shot. And so you'll get like, uh, you know, Nitaro will be like, blood! And you're like, yeah. <laughs> you're like, as you're shooting her in the fucking face. Or like, a, not like this! Like, <laughs> yeah, well, it was like that, it turns out. Uh, it's fucking crazy. <laughs> And it is actually like like the the counterplay of people going like you know release me as you're shooting them <laughs> like fucking uh, havoc being like set me free or whatever as you're fucking putting a bullet in his head. It is way crazier. I think it, it just it just plays way crazier than the just hey look at this pile of goo. There's some bones in it. Um, it it it's it is. It's a police brutality for sure. Um, and it, it, that makes it way more interesting than, than a lot of the other stuff, you know, because again, like, like I said, when we were streaming it last week, there's just sort of a thing where a lot of the fatalities sort of run together because it's like nine different ways to skewer up a, a skeleton and, um, oh yeah, look at this. Like, oh, the skeleton's coming out of him and oh, the skin's slopping off. And then, you know, there's little touches here where it's like, oh, they pulled his skull out and that's why this face is drooping because there's no skull in there anymore. And it's like, you see that and it's like, oh, <laughs> like I, you know, whatever. I, 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 some people are grossed out by it. I, I get that. I'm not, I'm not in the camp where I'm like, this is too far, uh, but I totally understand why people would, would feel that way. Um, for, for me, the, the cop shooting the guy in the head is actually the one that feels like the fucking craziest because it's grounded. It's based in reality. Hell man pulls person apart with spikes. That's fucking that's out of the movies. Cop shoots guy in the head. That's just Chicago, baby. Um, it, yeah, so I, I, yeah, I don't know. It's it's something. So so I will I will tell you now. It's not up yet. It will be up soon. The next inductee into the Jeff Gerstmann Hall of Fame is Mortal Kombat, the actual first Mortal Kombat, and um, playing that game again and really thinking about that game in the context of everything that's come after it. There is a starkness. There is a rawness. There is a, and, and some of it, there's a crudeness. I mean, you know, because it's the first one they made, whatever it is. The things in that game, the backgrounds, the style, the, um, like that game is gruesome in a way that feels, I don't know, like real is a weird term, right? I mean, you know, hell man still pulls his mask off and there's a skull underneath and there's, you know, but, but the, the, the martial arts movie magic that it has is something that gets thrown out for more fantastical, crazier stuff. Like by the time they get to mortal Kombat two, you've got big portals and trees with faces on them and all this other shit. Mortal Kombat one looks like you could have seen it in theaters and it's like, look at all these monks and they clap at the end of the fight. And then they fight the evil floating man and the big four-armed monster that's made as a weird puppet. Uh, and, and so there's something... It's not a perfect analogy. MK1 feels like practical effects and everything that came after it feels like visual effects, I guess, if that... Anyway. That striker brutality of check this out. I tased you and now I'm shooting you in the goddamn face. 
to me in some ways feels like it harkens back to the fucked up weird martial arts movie origins the the more grounded or, or whatever it is um that that those games used to have um and I would love to see more of that, honestly, for as fucked up as that. Again, I'm telling you how fucked up it is watching this cop shoot a guy in the face and then put his hands behind his back and just kind of smirk as he's covered in blood. Like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> um, if every finisher was like that, it would be too much. That would actually be too much. People would be like, fuck. The fuck is wrong with these people? The way the bodies get eviscerated in a billion different ways and stuff, that stuff's fun. That stuff's just like, ah, 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 you burned it this time too. What the fuck? Oh yeah, sure. Why not? Um, I have, an un I have not uh, maxed out uh, Striker's Mastery, so I haven't unlocked his full list of finishers, so I can't tell you, you know, can he plant evidence, all that? I don't know. Yeah. I, mm. I'm going to guess he probably doesn't do that, but could you imagine a world in which It'd be too much. It'd be too much. But oh God, like imagine a world where he tases him, shoots him, and then puts on a glove, pulls a pistol out of his pants, and then slides it into the guy's hand. <laughs> then it's like brutality. Like, uh, uh, anyway, um, <laughs> I Mortal Kombat One, the current, the new one, is a it's a fantastic game. Uh, it's got a whole lot going for it. I hope that they add up 30 more cameo characters. I, like, There's so many cool nostalgic references that should be on that roster. Uh, it would probably be a little hard to balance or something, but I just, even if the characters do the same moves, just the, the nostalgia of being able to pull out Cyrax and sector and, and seeing them do right by characters like Darius and some of the, like the, you know, and even on the main roster of main fighters, seeing like Lee May and Ashra and, and having these characters from the deadly Alliance era come back and seeing them do right by characters from the deadly Alliance era. Like Lee May is really cool. I, I, I think she's a, she's a really cool character in the story, but also just like neat moves, really interesting stuff. Like, like it's, it's neat. It's cool. Um, Again, it's a game where I I can't wait for Quan Chi to become a playable character because I think when you see him in the story and all the other stuff, I'm like, yeah, I want to see some. I want to see some more Quan Chi. That's something I've never said before in my life. But here we are. Um, what else? Uh, well, I guess we'll get to emails next week because we're kind of running out of time here. But uh, I have spent a little bit of time with Cyberpunk 2077's new update. Um, I have, I, I, I have not played any of the new DLC. And even if I had, I would not be able to tell you about it right now. I think is where things are at with that. Um, cause I fired it up and started messing around with the, with the updates and it's hey, it's DLSS 3.5 and all this stuff. It, it runs fucking great. Like I've got everything. And with the last update, it started like running, like performance wise started running really well. Um, but I've got everything turned all the way up to like their ray tracing overdrive mode and all this other stuff that they've got in there. And it's, a, I've got a 4090 just, you know, for the record. Um, and, uh, frame rate wise, I, it, it runs really well. It looks really nice. The path tracing, the lighting, like all that stuff looks really neat. Um, and it, it's kind of crazy in some ways. When I think about how that game ran at launch and when you got into cars and I mean, I had, I had a different computer at that point too. So, so there was that as well, but I've upgraded since then, but how fucked up that game was at launch. Um, they've gotten it a long way on that front. The other updates. I... So if you look at my save file in cyberpunk, I have played about, uh, 50 hours of that game. I finished it. I finished it multiple times, multiple different ways to try to make, uh, heads or tails of the endings and try to see if any of them were actually good. I don't think they are. I think the writing in that game, especially with the way that story wraps up, I think is pretty terrible. Um, they have inserted, they have the, the, I, I, so all I've really spent time with is the complete rebuild of the skill tree. 
and um, the the way XP is distributed and all this other stuff. Because it refunds all your points and you have to sit there and stare at the... You can refund them again, which you probably will do once you spend more time with it. But it's... The whole system feels completely different in a way that, like, if you were playing it fresh, it would probably be a much more interesting character building experience for me as someone who has, I don't know, 47 perk points or whatever to redistribute. You're looking at it and going like, okay, well, if I put points into this, then every time I kill somebody with this type of weapon, the spread gets reduced or I go and I proc into this mode and do this. And, and it was just a bunch of, it was a whole bunch of percentages and numbers and staring at it and going like, well, okay, wait, I need to, if I want to equip, more, there's now a loadout cap on the the cybernetics you can install in your body, and you can upgrade to unlock more slots. But also, you need to upgrade your level, your your cyber cap or whatever to to be able to equip all that shit. Um, and like things like armor, like clothing is just cosmetic now, or it'll have some stats like, you know, 5% bonus to sneaking, but like you won't have pairs of boots with armor on them anymore. It's just like, as you spec out and level up, you will increase your armor rating overall. Weapons are in tiers in, and the, the upgrade requirements have been changed. So it's like, they really spent a ton of time recrafting every single system in that game, every single thing that's in the pause menu, every single thing that's in the character menu, they have rebuilt in some way, shape or form. I don't know that it's better. It feels more true to like, as you do things, you will see the XP meter appear on screen and see that you earned points in cool or you earned points in technology because of the thing you just did. And there's a separate, uh, there was in the original game, but they've kind of rebuilt it as well of like, as you get more cool points, you will check off more bonuses in the cool category. Yes. If you, if you cyberpunk and cool, uh, if you cyberpunk and bad, then it's <laughs> as you're trying to hack stuff, it's really hard. Um, and that stuff seems really interesting. And, um, I can't, but, but again, I, I, none of that changes the writing. None of that fixes the things that I had like this, this, those systems in the previous game were maybe not as fleshed out as they are now, but, uh, my bigger problems with cyberpunk are not things that, that a patch like that is going to fix when they say, Oh, we've, we've fixed police response. And now the cops respond in a more video, like a more engaging way. Um, Again, I've played 50 hours of this game. I have finished it multiple times. I have no interest in going back because you made the cops better. Uh, I, I, as a graphical showpiece, it's really interesting to look at, you know, and, and just drive around the city and look at stuff with all the path tracing and everything. You look at it and go like, man, this, this does look really nice. Um... But like in terms of actually like playing that game again, like I I'm, I'm having a hard time. I, I will, I will play it. I don't know if I'll finish it, but I will at least start it. But like I spent like an hour and a half dicking around in the menus, spending all my perk points and going like, okay, well, I guess now I can, uh, now I guess I hack better and. Now, now I guess I can, I can dash now. I've spent points that gives, that have given me a dash and I can move faster when crouched and I can do this. And now I shoot better with pistols. And now when I, uh, swing a blunt object, it doesn't require as much stamina. Um, and all these other numbers based things that I just have a hard time really caring about. But I spent a lot of time looking at that system and then it was like, okay, now let's go start the DLC. And then I was like, I'm just going to turn this off. <laughs> and, and so, uh, that's why I say like, I, I, I couldn't tell you about it even if I had started it. Um, but I haven't, I haven't started it. So, uh, it's, it's, it's hard for me to think about like getting re-engaged in the world of cyberpunk again and spending all that time in the menu 
to respend those pet perk points and relearn all these systems. It was a feeling of just like, I, okay. Yeah, I guess. I don't know. And yeah, CD Projekt Red says, we recommend, yeah, someone pasted in the chat. We recommend starting a new game due to the number of changes starting fresh will enhance your overall gameplay experience. Dog, I know how this story ends. This isn't, I, this is not a game I want to start nine different saves in and be like, well, what if I did this this time? Like it's, that, it's not good enough for that. Nothing in that game is good enough to warrant a multiple playthroughs. It's just not. I, so yeah, anyway, I like that. That's just conceptually insane to me. And some people like the game enough that they will not have a problem doing that. So like, like whatever, man. But like, I, again, I spent 50 hours in that game. I did a ton of side stuff. There's still more side stuff to do. And even still when I load it up and go like, well, I guess I'll do some more side stuff. It's always the most boring. Like, all right, I walked in here and fucking shot a guy or talked to a guy. Like I, you know, this game is years old. It's cool that they made it better. But again, I think the writing and, and a lot of the character stuff they do along the way is not very good. And the idea of going through that again, just because you made the, the perk system better when I already, there's nothing, there's not enough there for me to want to do that. So maybe you are in a different boat with that. Like new content is the thing that would make me potentially interested. And that's why I say like, yeah, I'll, I'll probably check out the DLC at some point here. Uh, and, uh, and give that a look. Someone is a Soviet 66 just said Keanu is a very bad actor. I don't think Keanu Reeves is a very bad actor. I think the, the dialogue he was given was poor. And I think the way he read it, he was maybe not directed well. I think that the, the performance definitely could have been better. Um, but I don't, I don't think it's necessarily like, oh, if someone else was in that role, it would have been better. It's like, no, the words he's saying are disjointed and funky in ways that don't make sense in ways that people do not speak. Uh, but he's just reading what was put in front of him. He is not the problem with that game at all. Um, anyway, we're going to get going. I haven't touched Starfield in like a week. You know, I've been playing Mortal Kombat and all this other stuff. And, you know, like I am very close. Well, I, I, I seem to be close to the end of the main quest in Starfield. And I got to a point where it kind of revealed itself. And it's like, oh, this is, this is where this is heading, huh? And I found it to be kind of a turnoff. Um, I was not, I, I was not really interested in the answers they started giving me for like, oh, what's this mysterious thing? Like, okay. All righty. Uh, yeah. So I have not felt super compelled to dive back into that. Um, but I suppose I will finish it at some point here. I don't know. Anyway, that's video games. Be back tomorrow. Might be a late start tomorrow. Cause we're still doing, you know, we still got some doctor's appointments and some other stuff happening around here. Um, so, uh, yeah, we'll do some, we'll do some Wednesday streaming for sure, but, uh, I might not be here right at 10 AM. Um, because of circumstances. So, uh, thanks everybody for hanging out. I hope you enjoy the rest of your week. I hope you enjoy the rest of your, your, your day, all that sort of stuff. Who knows? Maybe a bunch of additional Microsoft documents will leak. We can stare at all that stuff. I don't know. Um, I also formatted my steam deck. It was just getting funky. And I had installed so much weird shit. Like, you know, it's like that situation where I installed the Battle.net client three different times. And who knows if it deleted it on the two times I had to reinstall it. And it was just crashing. You know, it, just, it wasn't restarting smoothly. Like, it would get stuck at the boot up screen and, and all that. So, wiped that, which was a little bit more uh, of an ordeal than I thought. Because after I wiped it, it wouldn't start up. I had to get the recovery image, re-image the whole thing from scratch. Not difficult, just time consuming. And on the other end of that, it's uh, it's running great. 
I got SSH going again. Emulators, easy shit. See ya.